<laughs> Number 10. Mesa Verde. When I think of places I'd like to pop my city, I can honestly say I don't first think of under a cliff. But think about it. Natural protection from the elements, assuming the cliff doesn't erode away over time like everything does, dropping huge chunks of rock on you from above. At Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, you'll find the remains of cliff dwellings and the cliff palace of the Pueblo people who inhabited the area around 900 years ago. The Pueblo people lived for a long time on top of the top of the mesas for over 600 years and then began to move to and build anything from storage rooms to whole villages underneath the cliffs, probably for protection from the climate change and harsh weather, but I'm assuming it was to just get some well needed shade. Number 9 Samarkand All roads lead to Rome. Well, then all silk roads lead to Samarkand. Or at least it was a famous pit stop along the way. No one is quite sure when Samarkand was founded. Some evidence suggests that there have been humans living in the area from at least 40,000 years ago. Long time. But one thing is for sure, both its history and finances were quite wealthy. Silk jade and all the goods that the Silk Road offered made their way to and through Samarkand. This made the city very wealthy. It exchanged empires the same way I exchanged bad gifts from your aunt at Christmas. Persian, Greek, Mongol, and most recently Soviet in what is now called Uzbekistan. Today you can still find ancient buildings and mosques from a time long past, as that was the main religion. However, the city was also a place of culture and art, which meant for a long time there was some coexistence going on. But it's really nice amongst the different faiths. Very nice, I like. Number eight, Orkney Islands. You've heard of Stonehenge, but that's been overdone countless times before. You want something new, a different location with the added benefit of having other sites for the kids to go to and check out nearby. Look no further than the stunning Orkney Islands, home to the stones of Stennis, Meishau, the Ring of Bodgar, and Scarabray otherwise known as the heart of Neolithic Orkney. Stenez is our main standing Stonehenge-like attraction. Meishau is a lovely underground burial mound sporting some striking 12th century Viking graffiti. Scarabray is an in-ground stone-built Neolithic settlement. And last but not least, the Ring of Brodgar is an even bigger circle of stones. You'll be well removed here at Orkney, situated as an archipelago right at the tippy top of Scotland with stunning views, angry Scottish neighbours, and the Nordic founded town of Kirkwall. Just bring a jacket maybe. Number 7 Nam Madal. This is one I had never heard of before. Very interesting too, especially one that has been described as the Venice of the Pacific. Sometimes I'm described as that. Not really. Some even think it has connections to Atlantis. Ooh, maybe. That I'm not sure of. However, if you took a pleasure cruise with your spouse down to the Pacific, and why not? Most people can't say that they've done that, so go do it. You would find an ancient stone ruins built upon some land, and more interestingly, built upon a coral reef. A series of small artificial islands connected by canals. Ones belonging to the Saudler dynasty, I'm pretty sure I said that right, which yes, that's new to me too. Today, Namadal is a protected heritage site. So you know what, Bumblebees? Don't go there and take anything that you weren't supposed to. Go look, but don't touch. I'm watching. I'm watching. Always watching. Number six, the city of Karl Supe. The ancient city of Karl Supe is the oldest civilization center in the whole of the Americas, being over 5,000 years old. You'll find this lovely world heritage site in the desert of Peru's Supe Valley, north of the Lima River. Being first built in 26,000 BC before the Great Pyramids were even built, the site itself has temples, an amphitheater, plazas, and ordinary houses. The society that actually built and lived here were apparently a gentle society, built on commerce and pleasure. Which is backed up by the fact that we haven't really found any defenses, mangled bodies, or tools of war. We did find tools of music though, specifically 32 flutes and 37 cornets. So the Andean people who inhabited this place didn't fight and they knew how to have a hoedown. Let's bring back this way of life, yeah, maybe? Up next is the City of the Gods number 5. Teotihuacan is its actual name. This sprawling ancient city in Mexico is known best for its astronomically aligned buildings and complex pyramid temples. Their building was dated back 2000 years and scientists have suspected a mixture of cultures including Mayan, Zapotec and Mixtec built the city so that they could house more than 100,000 people. They adorned it with murals and they had a transportation system. Evidence shows advanced agricultural practices that earned the city a reputation of being much more technologically 
develop than should be possible in pre Aztec Mexico. So naturally that brings us to the ideology of aliens, especially as the most massive temple, the Pyramid of the Sun, which is one of the largest constructions in the western hemisphere. It's also been noted that the alignment of the pyramids is based on calendar cycles. Many people believe that the flat top pyramid served as a landing pad where the alien secrets lay inside the impenetrable walls. In 2003 though, a sinkhole caused by a flood led to the discovery of the Avenue of the Dead Tunnel, connecting the Sun Temple with the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. People believe that this connection correlates with rituals and contacts shared between civilizations and aliens. These tunnels being used to transport sacrifice or make passage between the communication stations easier. Its name was given to it by the Aztecs when its deserted ruins were discovered sometime in the 1300s. It had already been abandoned for centuries at this point. When the names translated, it means the place where men become gods. And why they chose to name it that, we're unsure. When the Aztecs found it, there was likely a great amount of discernible history available in contrast to today's standards. Perhaps they saw writings and stories that we didn't, something to make them believe in godly powers of the temples or the peoples. We know frustratingly little about this mysterious society from the conditions of its rise to the circumstances of its collapse to its actual name. The Delphi site of Greece is number four. Alien theorists love to use Greeks as a basis for their theories. This is because of the possibility of life beyond Earth is one that began in ancient Greece world, originating at least as far back as the 4th century BC when ancient Greek society had schools of thought that speculated extraterrestrial life. One of the favorite examples is Delphi, Greece, where the stone masonry is eerily similar to that of Saxe Humana in Peru, which is believed to be a site of alien intervention. This was also the famous site of the Oracle of Delphi, a prophetic woman who would reside in the temple of Parmasus. She was rumored to have sat on a golden tripod over a fissure in limestone where she could breathe in the breath of Apollo and communicate with invisible forces. What she was breathing in, we aren't sure. According to toxologist Henry Spiller, both of the ways an oracle's vision would occur, either peaceful and slow or erratic and barely legible, are symptoms associated with inhalation of hydrocarbon gases, aka she could have just been zooted. But with the architecture as a star, alienologists jumped to say that this perhaps too could have truly been alien communication. The oracle was said to be possessed by Apollo in order to be asked prophetic questions about upcoming war, political actions, theories of life, and more. What if it wasn't Apollo, but rather she was channeling alien messages through an unconscious state that the fissure had been a beam of alien power going into her? Maybe that explains why Delphi, Greece is considered one of the three major UFO sighting hotbeds in Greece. In fact, on June 3rd of 2012, this picture was taken and posted on a UFO forum claiming the image to contain a UFO. What do you think, faux or fact? It's Corral Soup at number three. And despite its significance now, the importance of this site wasn't determined until decades after its discovery. Hilariously, this is because of the sheer size and complexity of it deceived scholars, and many believe that the site was more recent, so they left it largely ignored. It's in 1994, Ruth Shady was studying the site. She realized the lack of pottery wasn't because of the recency. The site was just dated before the advent of pot firing technology. Radiocarbon dating on some of the woven bags found inside the pyramid confirmed that Corral Soup were the locus of some of the earliest population concentrations and corporate architecture in South America, dating somewhere around 2600 BC, which upended history's well established timeline, pushing it back 4600 or more years. Now, since then, other Notre Chico sites have been found that date several hundred years earlier, but at the same time, Corral Soup was being built, so was the ziggurats in Mesopotamia and the steppe pyramids of Egypt, all incredibly similar structures. Ancient astronaut theorists believe that they could be profoundly connected, especially following the theory of ancient buildings such as these that tend to average around the 45 hundred age range. But the largest mystery of Corral Soup remains why it was abandoned so suddenly after thousands of years of inhabitation. There's no concrete evidence indicating a single event like an earthquake or large flood that ended this occupation. Number two is the Nazca Lines. These are a little more famous, so you may be familiar. They lay 320 kilometers southeast of Lima, and they cover a total length of 1,300 kilometers of high and dry plateau. They are seemingly at random. Joining them are 300 geometric shapes and 70 figures of animals, including a spider, a monkey, a hummingbird, and a bizarre alien man figure. The biggest shapes stretch nearly 1,200 feet across and are best viewed from the air. Scientists suspect that the Nazca drawings are as many as two millennia old, and because of their age, size, and visibility from above, and mysterious nature, the lines are often cited as one of the best examples of alien handiwork on Earth. I mean, how would an ancient culture have been able to make such huge designs in the desert without being able to fly? And why? The longest of the lines runs straight as an arrow for miles. 
Wales. So some believe it would have acted as a landing strip. Perhaps the art was meant to be gifts of appreciation to the aliens so they may look down at them from above. So how did the ancients manage to create such a precise etchings from the ground without being able to fly? The only theoretical way is that people could have flown in the air at this time is with the form of a hot air balloon as suggested by American explorer Jim Woodman. But we don't know for sure so the Nazca lines uh, remain a fascinating enigma. But the explanation for how the Nazca lines were physically created is quite simple. They're called geoglyphs. These enigmatic designs are made by removing the top rust colored layer of rocks and exposing the bright white sand underneath. And for number one let's investigate the Sardinian giant. The Mediterranean's most important archaeological discovery of the 20th century was a complete accident and also unearthed a creepy conspiracy. When farmers are plowing their fields in 1974 in central Cabras, they hit something. That something turned out to be 5,000 fragments that underwent a painstaking and lengthy reconstruction process to form gigantic statues. 16 boxers, 6 archers, and 6 warriors. This colossal army of 26 statues has a height of 8 feet 2 inches and weigh an average of 880 pounds each. Each figure was carved from one limestone block alone. They have highly stylized features such as triangular faces, T-shaped eyebrows and noses, and their most distinctive features are their eyes. They're represented by large round circles that stare straight ahead and right into your soul. I imagine if they weren't built to be intimidating, they were anyways. Every photo I've seen feels like they see through you. This is one of the aspects that give the statues an alien look, fueling alternative theories about the ancient astronauts. What is certain is that the giants are surrounded by an aura of legend since their discovery, as they belong to the mysterious Nuragiyak civilization, which very little is known of. The lands of Sardinia are also dotted with their tombs, which are called tombs of giants. Why? Because they're huge! The burial chambers are 65 to 98 feet in length and 7 to 10 feet deep. And according to the various inhabitants of nearby cities, very large bones were found in the countryside surrounding their village. Some claim that they belong to men up to 11 feet tall. Legendary painter Muscus himself found the remains of a giant skeleton in a cave in 1972, when he was still a child and made one of these claims himself. Interviewed repeatedly by journalists, locals stand by that any giant skeletons that have shown up or been shown to authorities or the experts when they are found almost always disappeared into thin air the next day. Sometimes so did the finder. Number 10. The Gardens the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They were described as a remarkable feat of engineering, with an ascending series of tiered gardens containing a wide variety of trees, shrubs, and vines, resembling a large green mountain constructed of mud bricks. Okay, yeah, the pyramids of Giza are very impressive, but just imagine this. Imagine how beautiful the city must have been with this monument. It's bizarre for the time because of just how magnificent it must have been. Sadly, there is not much evidence of the garden's existence, which leaves some people to believe it didn't exist at all. There is nothing left of the structure or any text from Babylon that even describe such a luscious garden. I like to believe it is real, as sometimes we need nice things in history to remind us that we're not all bloodthirsty warmongers. Number 9. It's a hard knock life for us. As great as our DNA is, sometimes things can get a little confusing in the process. Sometimes humans are born with defects. The human thing to do is understand, love, and respect everyone. This is something that the people of Mesopotamia did not practice. If a child was born with a defect or it just wasn't to their liking, they would oftentimes sacrifice the child. This is a kind of heinous act that just makes my skin crawl just thinking about it. I like to think there's a lesson to be learned with history. It gets a little messed up sometimes, but drowning kids? Ooh, I don't know. But yet again, I'm standing here as a second rate Chris Farley without a joke or a lesson to be learned. I guess for all the kids out there in Babylon, just watch your back because you might end up in a big river, but not the swimming kind. You might end up at the bottom of the river, and that's, that's not where you want to be. Wait till they find out that I have dyslexia and asthma. Number 8. Under the Mattress Honestly, when I heard about this one, I was a little shocked, but it makes sense, I guess. So, wind the clock back to the 1980s. Ronald Reagan was in the office, the Noid was around to save your pizzas, and hair. Ooh, man, the hair. The hair was crazy. I don't know what everyone was thinking. But what some young teenagers remember is a certain magazine that they had to hide under their mattress. A magazine that had centerfolds of women with interesting clothing options, or lack thereof. Well, this wasn't just an 80s staple, but might have just started back in the days between the two rivers. That's right, Mesopotamia had some rather interesting art. Art that may or may not feature a certain activity. 
excuse me, it's <clears throat> getting a little warm in here. These are pieces that are often displaying humans in interesting positions. And well, I'm not sure where you'd hang these in the kitchen, in ye olde living room, in the bedroom. Mom, don't look under my mattress. I totally don't have artistic stone carvings of people doing it. Ugh, leave me alone. Number seven, Hammurabi Justice. King Hammurabi might not be someone you've heard of, but to the law and law study, it's basically justice 101. King Hammurabi was known for a few things, but perhaps best known for his code of laws. An eye for an eye, which basically means you get what you give. Steal from a merchant, merchant takes from you. Or basically, you lose a hand. Make the punishment fit the crime. This is the best that we can come up with, which back in the day, seemed to work for a while, so okay. However, an eye for an eye will make the world blind, or just have a ton of people with only one eye. 50% off glasses, maybe? I don't know. Number six, the tower of what? Whether you like it or not, we like to build things. It's just what we do, and we love to build them high. Think of all the towering monuments we build as humans that display our engineering prowess. The Empire State Building, the CN Tower, and the tower of piled up laundry in my bedroom I'm definitely gonna put away. I just haven't gotten around to it yet, Mom. Leave me alone. Usually constructed of the finest wood, brick, and steel. However, one king in Mesopotamia had a different idea to scare off any attackers and flex what might be the weirdest flex ever, but okay. He made a tower of flesh. Again, for the people who are watching this while eating, a tower of flesh, human flesh. That must have been the worst pile of filth and disgust that this earth has ever seen. This is the same kind of thing that turns people origin story starter pack. It's what turns Colonel Kurtz into Marlon Brando. This tower of flesh, what have you done to my boy? A carrier pigeon brought me a message when I was practicing a really bad Marlon Brando impression, and it was from the chief, and he said it ain't it. Speaking of lost trade cities, let's visit the city of Great Zimbabwe. Near what's modern day Masvingo, near Great Zimbabwe, was built sometime around or before the 11th century and is now a world heritage site. The city was a capital of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe, which was a Shona, Bantu, trading empire. And it was a wealthy one to boot. Archaeologists have found pottery from China and Persia, as well as Arab coins in the ruins there. The elite of Zimbabwe empire controlled the trade up and down the East African coast. Great Zimbabwe's center was a palace enclosed by a granite wall some five meters high. Today it's separated into three sections. The hill complex built in 900 CE, the great enclosure built in the 14th century, and the valley ruins, a sprawling community of houses. The distribution and numbers of houses imply the city was home to a population between 10 and 20,000. However, the city was largely abandoned by the 15th century. The exact reasons for the abandonment, once again, are unknown. But it's likely exhaustion of resources and overpopulation that were contributing factors. While it was found in 1867, Significant looting and destruction occurred in the 20th century at the hands of European visitors. While they were all too happy to loot, in the racism they felt that the city was still too sophisticated to have been built by Africans and instead thought it was built by non-African people. This means artifacts and circulation that could teach us more about this great nation are misidentified and attributed to being from somewhere else and we don't know. Shrouds of this missing population are now more so in mystery. This city was featured famously in Indiana Jones, the city Taunus. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, the city Taunus had being buried by an ancient sandstorm and rediscovered by the Yahtzee, as Taylor and Olivia like to call them, villains, searching for the Ark of the Covenant. But this baby is also biblical, or well, torical. Readers of the Old Testament may know this city as Zone. This is where Moses was said to have worked his miracles. The riches uncovered from the ancient city of Tanis, which is located on the Nile Delta northeast of Cairo, include a royal tomb complex filled with golden masks, jewelry, silver coffins, and other treasures rivaling those of King Tut. So it can be in one of the world's oldest scriptures and a popular movie franchise, so why don't you know about it? Why for more than six decades, the riches from its ruler's tombs remained largely unknown when it was first found and excavated in 1825? World War II started just as the royal tomb was discovered in 1939. Nobody could wonder over ancient treasures when war was bringing in society. After the war, it never had its time to shine either since damage control was top priority. We know nothing of their civilization, where they went, what they spoke, dressed, ate, or even how they governed. Although some of 
the Tanis treasures can now be found in Cairo's Egyptian Museum, and a sacred lake dedicated to the goddess Mut was located in 2009. Scientists know there's more to be discovered. Infrared satellite imagery reveals more buildings waiting, buried under sand. The Indus Valley was great, 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 then gone. Mesopotamia and Egypt evolved over time, conquerors and traders merging with other cultures. The Indus Valley civilization, however, which was the largest of the three and reigned between 25 and 1700 BC, collapsed and vanished, and no one knows why. What's now modern day Pakistan, the Indus Valley civilization was blessed by the highly fertile lands and the Indus River floodplain. They traded with nearby Mesopotamia, and the two cities, Harappa, discovered in 1921, and Mohenjo Daro in 1922, were once home to 40 to 50,000 people, which testifies to their sophistication in central planning. They were farmers, traders, commoners, priests, and artisans. The culture was literate with an elaborate script that remains largely undeciphered. Important innovations included standardized weights and measurement systems and stone seal carving. We know that around 1900 BC, invaders wiped out the city of Monheo Daro, and more recent discoveries using river sediment from the Arabian Sea show that heavy monsoons occurred during the Arctic freeze, which may have driven the civilization up into the hills. We still know very little about life in the Indus Valley. We've yet to decode their writing or understand their arts and cultures. Archaeologists continue to dig, looking for clues to piece together the story of this mysterious civilization and where they went. The long lost city of Etzanoa is up next. We love a city with a fun preamble like that. It always signifies a good story. Legend, yes legend, ooh, tells us of a vast ancient indigenous metropolis, housing more than 20,000 citizens and flourishing near present day Arkansas City in south central Kansas. The citizens of Etzanoa, now ancestors to the Wichita Nation, were referred to as the Great Settlement by other indigenous groups. They lived in houses reportedly shaped like big beehives, each holding around a dozen people with lush gardens between the homes during the warm seasons. And during the cold months, the community would follow the bison herds and erect teepees as temporary travel dwellings. No motel fees necessary. They had strong artisanal traditions and an extensive trade network that reached as far as the Aztec capital. Their artifacts have been identified in countless countries. Starting in the late 16th century, Spanish conquistadors on a quest for gold contacted the group living in this region for trade. According to Spanish accounts, when they met, the two groups were friendly and cordial with each other and even shared corn cakes. But in 1601, someone had to screw that up and it was greedy Spanish colonist Juan de Ornate, who took clan members hostage. The clan returned for them and attacked the Spanish, who fought, in turn fired four cannons. The clan then retreats and disappears. Forever. It's as if they decided the outside world didn't deserve them in a Wakanda style twist and vanish behind a curtain from all trades and their own land seemingly overnight. French explorers who passed through in the 1700s did not find a city despite the legend, and archaeologists summarize that smallpox or other diseases probably killed most of the original settlers. Some of our only remaining evidence that they existed was a map drawn by one of the hostages as he after he was taken back to New Mexico. It's in fact the only reason that we know that its name is Etzanoa. It remained a mystery until 2016 when a local teen found and a cannonball linked to the 17th century battle. The long lost city, and at least its remnants, had finally been rediscovered, and they were covered by a golf course. And now for the city that may be Atlantis, Haliki. What makes Atlantis such a touchy subject is the fact that we've never found it, but documents exist from centuries ago that mention its existence multiple times as a trade city. But Halki existed, and what happened to them may be our Atlantis origin, or there are simply more than one underwater cities than we'd like to believe. The ancient Greek city state of Helki ruled as an important economic, cultural, and religious center. By the 4th century, the city led the Achaean League, which was a confederation of cities, and established colonies such as Sabaris in southern Italy. It's also listed as one of the ally cities in the Iliad. Now, according to classical historians, in 373 BC, something whack went down. It's said for five days, snakes, mice, and other creatures deserted the city for higher grounds, then an earthquake struck, the city plummeted into the ground, and the ocean washed over it, killing all residents. Sounds like Venice and LA in a couple years. This vanished city faded into legend and its location remained unknown despite hundreds of 19th and 20th century explorers searching. In 2001, an archaeological team turned its attention to inland to the delta formed by rivers flowing into the gulf. There they finally found it. 4th century BC walls, coins, and pottery buried under centuries of silt. The long lost city had appeared once more. Excavations continue to this day so we may learn the language, politics, and culture and overall history of this vanished city. Kicking off the list at number 
number 10, Roanoke Island, North Carolina. Just off the coast of what is now North Carolina, back in August 1587, around 100 English settlers arrived to Roanoke Island. John White, governor of the new colony, had to sail back to England to grab supplies. But while he was away, a naval war broke out between England and Spain, so his commute was delayed eh, just a tad, you know. He got back three years later in 1590 with said supplies. He's like, hey, sorry I'm late, we got some uh, naval war traffic, you know how it is. Upon arrival, however, nobody was there anymore, including his wife, daughter, granddaughter, anybody. Among the 100 or so inhabitants, they all vanished. The only hint as to where they went or what even happened was the words Croatone and Crow carved into a wooden post and CRO on a tree. Now Croatone or Croatoan was the name of the Native American tribe that lived on the island as well. But after looking for evidence, theories, even archeological exploration, experts still can't figure this one out. I've actually been to this island back when I was 16, so this one really creeped me out, not gonna lie. That's why I wanted to start with this one. Number nine, the Mississippians. We'll dial back the calendar to 700 CE. Now at this point, before European colonization, the American Southeast was home to the Mississippians. Their main area was the city called called Cahokia, which is now modern day Collinsville, Illinois. It's not large either, it's just six square miles. Check out this photo of Monk's Mound, a now historic site. We look at ancient Egyptians and our jaws drop at the sight of those pyramids, plus their alignment with the stars, it's all naturally fascinating. Well, Cahokia was once home to pyramids and large wooden structures as well. We're not exactly sure what happened to this 40,000 person civilization, but experts guess famine and disease. Number eight, Katahuyuk. Another ancient city, another ancient mystery. This time we're looking at what's currently South Central Turkey. About 9,000 years ago, it looked a lot different. Katahuyuk was popping off until 7,000 years ago, but again, we have no clue what really happened. The most interesting tidbit of history here is the way that this ancient civilization built their homes. They made houses side by side, really close together, and as fitting as it is for this channel, you would say it was almost like a hive-like system. They didn't have doors, they didn't have mail slots or welcome mats. Instead, they had holes on their roofs. That's how they got in and out every day. So yeah, they would use ladders to get in and out, which I gotta say, sounds pretty exhausting. They're probably all pretty ripped. Number seven, Mayans. One of the most advanced civilizations on this list, the Maya, were somehow able to create these massive stone structures in the middle of southern Mexico jungles. Next to the Egyptian pyramids, I'd say these are almost just as popular at this point. One of the most interesting pieces of the Maya, I'm sure as we all recall, was their calendar and the way that they worked it. I mean, we made a movie about 2012. The news was talking about 2012. Literally 12 years after Y2K, we're like, what if it happens again? Like, you know, this time seems serious. It's, it's not, it's not gonna happen. We're good for now. We're gonna probably end ourselves before a calendar or you know, a movie does. The Yucatan jungles are filled with pyramids and beautiful complex monuments lost in time, but where did the builders go and why did they leave? Well, a couple scientists analyzed rock samples around these areas and they were able to study the water levels in nearby lakes, suggesting that the reason the Mayans disappeared were not aliens, but rather they collapsed because of a drought. That checks out. Aliens are cool, you know, and the calendar stuff's cool, but no, nah, they're just drought. Number six, Gobekli Tepe. Just six miles from the ancient Turkey city, Yurfa, Gobekli Tepe is 100,000 years old. They are these massive stone circles created by a civilization that predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. Yeah, it's nuts. We're convinced it's the world's oldest temple, a holy temple rather, because this area in the world, I mean, now it may not be a spectacle, but thousands of years ago, you would be able to see the horizon in every single direction. Herds of beautiful animals racing by, fields of barley and wheat, it would have looked like a temple from Legend of Zelda. Masterpiece. It was actually first discovered back in the 1960s by university anthropologists. They were doing a survey of the region, found this place, and assumed it was an ancient cemetery and then nothing more, and then continued on their merry way. Now cut to 1994, best year ever. Klaus Schmidt was doing surveys for himself, found the same site, and knew right away from the first glance that this was man-made and there was much, much more to it. Number five, Anasazi. Before the first skyscrapers were built in the 1880s, the Anasazi built massive stone buildings on the side of cliffs back in the 12th century. Some of these walls housed up to hundreds of residents, right? Like a skyscraper, a building, like a condo, just in the wall. What's now present day Mesa Verde National Park was pretty intense back in the earlier days. Scientists have uncovered some hints as to where these creative cliff builders disappeared to. Well, violence, that seems to be the common 
denominator here. Yeah, the thing that's still going strong today, well, thousands of years ago, back in the 12th century United States, long-term drought led to the Anasazi to violence, and perhaps they wiped out each other. Other theories suggest that the Anasazi had to abandon their massive homes around the 1300s and then travel south. Either way, these are so impressive to look at. Number four. Ancient Vikings. I'm a big Assassin's Creed fan. When they announced Vikings as their newest installment, I was pretty excited. Then I started playing it and I was like, yeah, that's not great. I'm a big Norse mythology fan, okay? But what actually happened to Greenland's Vikings? That's the mystery. Well, around 985 AD, Eric the Red arrived with a large fleet to colonize the island. And of course, was subsequently banished for manslaughter. So now we have two colonies on Greenland, a large Eastern colony and a small Western one. Now these Vikings didn't build massive pyramids, but instead they built stone churches that are still standing to this day. These Vikings were around for a few hundred years and at one point in time, there were 5,000 Vikings, give or take. Now that's incredible, but later on in 1721, a missionary expedition arrived and there were not 5,000 Vikings. In fact, there were no Vikings. Where did they go? Archaeologists did the digging and apparently the Western settlement died off around 1400 AD. And just decades later, the Eastern settlement was abandoned. Well, there's a handful of family fun movies that hint to what happened. The Ice Age, yeah. Well, the small one in the 14th century, at least, is the biggest factor on where these Vikings disappeared to. Yeah, just a small Ice Age, classic. That's uh, haunting for a Canadian to hear. Number three. Easter Island. Back between 300 and 1200 AD, Polynesians used canoes, not carnival cruise ships, canoes to somehow travel all the way to Easter Island, over 2000 miles away from Chile. Yeah, that feat in itself is impressive, but when you start really thinking about the Easter Island heads on the actual island, it gets even more impressive. The Easter Island Moai statues, keep in mind there were hundreds, reach up to 32 feet high, and they weigh over 82 tons. It was a sight to see. That was until the 1800s. That's when the civilization suddenly vanished out of nowhere. Many of these statues were also destroyed during this time. The population as well was decreased drastically and the island's higher ups, be it priests or chiefs, whoever, were all overthrown. Well, whatever happened may give us some ideas for the future. Easter Islanders cut down so many trees that before their seeds could even enter the earth again, rats ate them. So these guys simply ran out of trees, which means they ran out of rope or the ability to make more canoes. So they were trapped. So naturally, a civil war began alongside starvation. Plus the arrival of Europeans in 1722, they immediately wiped out most of the remaining Easter Islanders. And then around the late 1800s, waves of smallpox reduced the amount of island natives to just 100. It was brutal. Number two, the Mississippians. We'll dial back the calendar now to 700 CE. Now at this point, before European colonization, the American Southeast was home to the Mississippians. Their main area was the city called Cahuikia, which is now modern day Collinsville, Illinois. And that's not large either, it's just six square miles. Now check out this photo of Monk's Mound, a now historic site. We look at ancient Egyptians and our jaws drop at the sight of those pyramids, plus their alignment with the stars that's obviously, of course, fascinating. Well, Kahuikia was once home to pyramids and large wooden structures as well. We're not exactly sure what happened to this 40,000 person civilization, but experts guess famine and disease were one of the many factors. And finally, number one. Clovis. Taking a look at some mammoth hunters for a last point here. Now this civilization is considered the first inhabitants of the new world. Pretty intense stuff. Hunters would use what's called Clovis points to get their next meal. They would use chipped flint and they had to hunt bison, mammoths, deer, anything that had skin to be used for shelter and or clothing. In fact, this 10,000 year old civilization may have disappeared at the same time as mammoths. After all, with these historical beasts acting as both your gear and your food, yeah, eating them ought to do some damage down the road. Not even an ice age was included yet, and already they're running out of resources. Number 10 is the pyramids of Chichen Itza. These ancient Mayan pyramids are obvious ones to end up on our list. This ancient structure has long since been connected to aliens. Many believe that they helped build the structure, but also use them as markers for landing space vessels. There's of course a theory as well though that the top of the pyramid has admitted a powerful energy beam, enabling the ancient Mayans to communicate with aliens or other pyramids around the world, implying the potential of interconnectedness between multiple pyramids and civilizations that we'll talk about through this video. Number 9 is the Vastu Architecture. These temples in India contain intriguing alien-like depictions carved on their stone walls. People flying, alien-esque figures, strange flying devices, the whole alien shebang. So one theory for this is that aliens visited ancient Indians and these interactions 
interactions are depicted on their stonework now as a result. And to tack onto that, some believe that when these aliens shared their flying technology, the Indian people began to worship them as their gods. Naturally, we circle back to the concept of pyramids and grand temples being built to having the ability to harness energy from above to communicate with aliens or other civilizations as well. But it's been said that these temples were constructed with specific design given in old Hindu texts known as Vastu Shastra, and the texts give intensely specific considerations to astronomy in its design, basing it off of all the movements of the stars and planets. So maybe a space laser being emitted from the temple isn't too far off. The gods, architectural methods, and advanced technology may not confirm the existence of aliens coming to Indian land, but at least can raise some suspicion. Anyways, the temples show a similarities to the depiction of an ancient Indian flying machine called Vin Amas, which will be number 8 on the countdown. Script from over 2000 years ago in India claimed dozens of accounts of people seeing these flying machines. They're described differently in some accounts, man made wings like a plane, a disc shape, and a famous cloud palace depiction. The Sanskrit word Vin Manana, when translated, literally means measuring out, traversing. In short, it means some form of aircraft. When 8 chapters of this ancient document are translated from Sanskrit, they revealed an intriguing list of these features that the devices had, such as remote images on screens, remote sounds. To protect itself, it had the ability to disguise itself as a cloud or create terrifying sounds. The discussion on Vimamana includes various constructions to double as boats or even submarines. There's discourses on astrophoric pressure, aeronautic hazards, and even dietary and clothing for aviators. These writings were no manifestations or metaphors. They talked about how the gods rode them, but anyone may ride and own one as well. They were treated as manufactured physical objects or even flying houses. For this much ancient text to be translated and have so much modern ideology and inventions, well it must be aliens or perhaps some ancient sci-fi stories or perhaps now we see these objects with hindsight and try to fit them into something that makes more sense to us now such as an airplane. But they're just anything but and we'll never know. Number 7 is Stonehenge, another you should know to expect to see on this list. Now I won't bring up things like the Easter head since we have sufficient evidence of human craft, but Stonehenge? On the table, so let's dive in. The circle of stone sits in the countryside of Salisbury and it comes from the Neolithic period, which was the final division of the Stone Age. They stand alone, a vast meadow sprawling for miles around it. Having visited Stonehenge myself, I can tell you that you have the choice of a 20 minute walk or a 5 minute shuttle ride. The energy is very void, as if the air is free of static and just doesn't seem to move. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it does truly feel unearthly. These stones weigh an average of 50 tons and are over 8 feet in height. They seemingly dropped into their ring, no rhyme or reason in their placement, at least to Swift author Eric Von Danken, who suggests that they may be a model of the solar system that doubled as an alien landing pad. How Stonehenge is assembled is unknown to us. There's no documentation, no other ruins, no artifacts. Facts, there's genuinely nothing but these stones, some of which were somehow lifted feet upwards and placed horizontally on others. There's no way to know what it means either, but what we do know is that the stones are somehow perfectly aligned with solstices and eclipses, suggesting that the builders did know astrological charts and were able to keep an eye on the heavens. That's if they didn't come from them. Number six is interplanetary, but still alien to us, hieroglyphics on Mars. We've always talked about and conspired about aliens visiting us in ancient civilizations here on Earth. Earth, but what if they visited elsewhere? Or we have. Ooh, sorry, that's ghosts, not aliens. Anyways, the reason for that is some NASA photos were released in 2015 that were taken by the Curiosity rover. It shows what looks like some kind of writing or hieroglyphic on the rocks. A boxy two shape next to what looks like a curved Y with two other extending legs are side by side. While we can't be sure what the marks are at this point, it certainly has enthused ancient alien believers who claim that this is yet more evidence that aliens and ancient people visited one another. But skeptics argue the so called discoveries on the images sent back by the rover are just textures in the rock. Despite the temptation of reading into evidence found so far, scientists understanding of Martian history is still unfolding. Questions up for debate are, was the ancient Martian atmosphere thick enough to keep the planet warm and wet for the time necessary to nurture life, are organic compounds found as signs of life, or simple chemistry that occurs when Martian rock interacts with our sun and water? What's your take? Hieroglyphics and conspiracy or do you think they're just some cracked Rocks. Number 5. Rapid Nui 
Also referred to as the Easter Islanders, the Rapa Nui is known most famously for their Easter Island heads, the Moai, that still to this day reach up to 13 feet tall and weigh over 80 tons. Massive achievements. Now how did they build these things and also how did they move them around? Well there's of course a crazy alien theory and it's my favorite theory of all. The indigenous Rapa Nui claim that these statues once roamed the land like night at the museum but with, you know, less bubblegum and fun. There were once thousands of these sculptures but during the 1700s, Civil Wars was resulted in the Rapa Nui tearing them all apart. It was already an impressive feat building the Moai, but in 1914, archaeologists discovered they also had bodies beneath them. Just like us YouTubers, you never know underneath here. We could be seven feet tall or we could be five feet tall, you really don't know. Look at this, you have no idea. The theory that all these statues would move around seems a little bit more plausible now that we know that. At number four, Nubia. The ancient civilization of Nubia was almost like ancient Egypt adjacent until it wasn't. Nubia was located south of Egypt and Sudan, and at one point they even ruled Egypt. Nubia even had their own pyramids, and over 200 of them still remain today. The period that the Nubians ruled over Egypt was known as Egypt's 25th dynasty, or the Black Dynasty, because of the dark skin of the Nubian pharaohs, and this time was known for its stability and prosperity, with a lot of their emphasis being on arts and culture of the people. This civilization had their own written language and rich culture, and they were also very wealthy as they were situated on a literal gold mine. They continued to thrive until an Egyptian pharaoh raided Nubia and turned it into a mineral extraction outpost. Rather than Nubia rule over Egypt, the tables turned and the roles were reversed, making Nubia an underling of Egypt. Eventually the Nubian people just assimilated into the Egyptian population and Nubia just died off over time. Number 3. The Incas their city is currently a wonder of the modern world. Machu Picchu was built over 500 years ago. It was once known as the lost city of the Inca, and it's absolutely beautiful. It was first discovered in 1911 by archaeologist Hiram Bingham when he and a small team were originally heading out to find the ancient city of Vilcabamba, but instead they found this landmark. The stones used to build the city were even heavier than they already look. We look at Stonehenge in disbelief right now, wondering how humans were able to lift those rocks. But look at this place. These stones each weighed over 50 tons, and with Machu Picchu literally translating to old mountain, those hills certainly don't look easy to climb. I complained about doing two trips carrying groceries. My back hurts just looking at this thing. The Inca were impressive builders. The city is designed perfectly. I mean, evidently. After 500 years of earthquakes and horrible weather, it's wild that the city is still in the shape that it's in. Elongated skulls were also found on the site by archaeologists, and many believe that it's aliens thanks to pop culture, but elongated skulls were actually a sign of royalty in the Incas. It's no surprise Machu Picchu is the most visited place in Peru. You just might want to take your trail shoes when you head over there. At number two, Norte Chico Civilization. The story of the Norte Chico Civilization is fascinating, yet also shrouded in mystery. Overall, very little is known about the Norte Chico Civilization, but it is believed that this pre-Columbian society is one of the oldest known civilization in the Americas. Researchers know more about this civilization's infrastructure than the way that the people lived. We know that they had huge buildings like pyramids and complex irrigation systems, but what makes this so bizarre is the fact that there's no evidence of any pottery in the civilization which suggests that they don't know how to use it. How are you going to build a whole pyramid but struggle to make a pot? I don't get it. There is also evidence that these people worship some kind of deity, but again, no one knows what form this deity took. Now here's where the mystery really comes in. No one knows what happened to the Norte Chico civilization. The settlements were abandoned sometime around 1800 BC, but no one really knows why. There's no evidence of any kind of warfare and there were no natural disasters to cause them to flee their homes. The people just kind of disappeared and no one has been able to piece together the puzzle, so we may never know. And coming in at number one, the Greek civilization. The Antikythera mechanism is the world's oldest analog computer. It would keep track of the cosmos and to this day we're trying to figure out the exact purpose of it or how it was built. But what we do know is that one of those dials in there was meant to keep track of the Olympics. That's how important this event was. Thanks to the ancient Greeks, now we get to see dudes huck and shot puts at people. It's great. The ancient Greek civilization thrived in Greece around 500 BC to 2700 BC. The rich history of ancient Greeks spans such a long time that we've divided their time into periods, like the Archaic, Hellenistic, and Classical period. Their wine was so good that they had a wine god in the pantheon. God Dionysus. What an OG. It was deemed a hubris for Greeks to get intoxicated, so they would also add water to their wine. That way they could keep the party going all night, of course, but actually it was done so nobody became violent. Only God Dionysus would drink wine straight out. That's pretty, pretty hardcore. If inventing the Olympics wasn't badass enough, they also used stones instead of toilet paper, so 
I'll let you imagine that in your head. We'll leave on that note. That's a nice pretty image to finish on. We'll start with one that we may be a little bit more familiar with, the mystery of Roanoke. For most on the list, the civilization as well as the city was lost, but in the case of Roanoke, it was only ever the civilization. See, Roanoke is formed when 115 English colonialists landed on the island, which is off the North Carolina coast. Led by Governor John White, the first English children are born in the Americas. White leaves his son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter with the rest of the new colony to sail back to England for more supplies. He returns three years later in 1587, but there was nothing. No sign of a struggle or fight, no bodies to be found. Homes were untouched even, just frozen in time. The only clue were the words Croatoan and Croa carved into a wooden post and a tree. The lost colonists were never found. But some other things were. In 2012, a map of Virginia Pars drawn by John White revealed plans of a secret fort 50 miles west of Roanoke. Following said map, archaeologists find two sites and uncover a trove of European artifacts near the indigenous community of Metaquem. It's a compelling evidence of the Roanoke colony. Just as months before this discovery, an archaeologist has claimed to find artifacts also belonging to the colonists on the modern island of Hatteras, which is 50 miles from Roanoke and was at the time known as Croatoan, the same word carved into the tree. Series for the missing community naturally include indigenous attacks, but the lack of damage to the city and the seeming leave of their own accord just doesn't line up. So many believe that with lack of supplies while John White was gone, these settlers assimilated into indigenous clans and they left left with a word behind as a message to John where they'd gone. He just never thought to look there and we continue to look for clues. Another famed city is the legend of El Dorado. The Spanish explorers in South America hear of the legend of El Dorado for the first time in the 1500s. Said to be somewhere in the Andes, the Moisa indigenous people had initiated a new chief by dusting him head to toe in gold and throwing pounds of golds, emeralds, and other precious stones into a sacred lake. The chief's name was El Dorado, the golden one. Well, just like all the cartoons when the eyes roll out of the head and the jaw and tongue dramatically drop to the ground, these greedy colonists were weak in the knees at the idea of finding and pillaging sacred ritual gold. These adventures, Spanish, German, Portuguese, and English, ventured deep into any place that seemed promising, such as the unforgiving landscapes of Colombia, Guyana, and Brazil. In the search for mythic treasure that it seems indigenous ancestors protected from their greed, sending death in all forms towards these colonizers. Disease, starvation, storms, snakes, and predators. Over time, El Dorado went from being a man to a city to a valley paved with with gold just waiting for discovery. No golden trove was ever or has ever been found. Now there may be some truth to the legend, however, the lake mentioned in the Muisca story may be Laguna Guadativia, which is high in the Andes near Colombia. Some golden objects and jewels have been dredged in that body of water and another nearby, but attempts to drain the lake and recover the reputed riches have all failed. Whatever treasure down there remains undisturbed and protected by the force they were given to. What happened to Angkor is the next question that we'll be trying to crack. It's one that archaeologists have been trying to crack for years. On the other side of the world, the empire once spread across what's modern day Cambodia and was one of the largest civilizations in the world. The estimated population was 700 to 900,000 people. If that estimation is correct, this means that the population of Angkor was roughly comparable to almost the 1 million people who lived in ancient Rome at its height. Angkor remains one of the most important archaeological sites in Southeast Asia and is protected World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Its famous temple, Angkor Wat, is one of the seven wonders of the world. Since it stretches over 400 kilometers, including forests, the remains of different capitas in the Kamar Empire range from 9th to 15th century and also include famous temples Angkor Thom and Bayon. Its height between 1000 and 1200 CE, it had streets, grid systems, houses and apartments, and then this civilization vanished. By the time the Portuguese missionaries arrived in the 16th century, the city was abandoned and its temples enshrouded in vegetation. Experts are unsure as what to cause the civilization to disappear, leaving its cities at the mercy of relentless jungle. Theories range from environmental catastrophe to war. There are few written accounts that survived that period and so it's an enduring mystery and historians don't have much evidence to grasp onto. Time for me to butcher this name again, it's Tio Hikan. I'm gonna be calling it Tio. I do my best guys. Anyways, if you watch our top 10 ancient alien discoveries that will confuse you video, you may know the city also as being called the city of the gods. At its peak in 400 AD, Tio was just 30 miles northeast of what's present day Mexico 
Mexico City in the Valley of Mexico. This impressive city held an estimated population of over 100,000 and held palaces, temples, plazas, and thousands of apartments in a grid systemed road and once reigned as the largest city in the Americas. One of its most famous structures was the topic of our alien video. It's an insanely grand pyramid of the sun, venerating a deity within the society. There's also the nearby pyramid of the moon which was discovered to have sacrificial purposes. Skeletons of pumas, eagles, and wolves are found alongside 12 human skeletons, 10 of which were decapitated. But like all cities on our list, something happened. In the case of Tia, it's known that the city burned but we're unsure how it started. The stone still carries this telltale signs of an inferno of an insane size. Some wonder if it was invading Greeks using their famous hot Greek fire. The city never recovered from said fire. By the time the Aztecs found it in the 1400s and named it what it they did, which by the way in English stands for the place where the gods were created, the city had been abandoned for centuries. So just who these people were, where they came from, and what the city's true name is or what language they spoke remain a mystery that archaeologists are still working to uncover. This next society was said to have been as powerful as the Incas and the Aztecs, the Spiro Nation Mounds. And if prospectors hadn't stumbled upon their burial chamber in 1933, we would have never known they existed. The chamber had been closed for well over 500 years and had stunning treasures such as engraved conch shells, pearl and shell beads, large human effigy pipes, and brightly hued blankets and robes. Newspapers dubbed this an American King Tut's tomb. The chamber led to the discovery of 12 mounds, the elite's village area and the supporting city area. This is all that remains of a prehistoric power that once equaled the size and sophistication of the Aztec and Inca as mentioned. The Spiro people ruled over the Mississippian culture and took nearly two thirds of what is now the United States. It became a permanent settlement around the 800 AD point and seemingly exists until 1450 AD. Artifacts depict a prosperous trading city that held and assumed 10,000 plus people. There's copper from the Great Lakes, conches from the Gulf of Mexico, beads from the Sea of Cortez, and cups from the Florida Keys. According to historian Eric Singleton, what truly makes Spiro so unique is that not only is the most object laden mound ever discovered in North America, but it included objects from around the known world of the time, which was North America. They invited people around the world to bring known holy objects to Spiro to be ritualistically acted upon. But the Spiro people mysteriously disappeared by 1500, perhaps due to an extended drought or political battle. It's believed that the unpredictable weather changes started in 1250 are the cause, as by 1450 the drought cycle continued and the mound city seemingly abandoned. This site remained mostly untouched until the 1930s when treasure hunters got wind of antiquities buried in the earth. What followed was one of the largest and longest episodes of looting in North America, and now indigenous colonies once again have to battle get their items rightfully returned. Number five, rubber. Rubber is a fundamental. I mean, sure, the long-term effects for rubber are questionable in turn. Now we have literal pits full of tires, but where did it all begin and why? The Maya created art, they looked to the stars and made calendars, but what did they do when they wanted to have a good time? Mayan meals were composed of maize, squash, and beans with tons of crops. Turns out the Maya were the ones who created elastic long before Mr. Goodyear over here. They made elastic from latex by mixing it with other plants. They really created bouncy balls, if anything. They took latex from trees and mixed it with vine juice. This was around 1600 BC, and you can't invent rubber balls without creating some. Number four. Ball games. Yeah, imagine inventing a bouncy ball. You can now create any game you want, any rules. You'll never lose again. How great is that? The Maya have pretty impressive ball courts. These games were all but fun, honestly. These were religious events. These games would last around 20 days on average, so I hope you warmed up that harm because you're gonna be here for a while. The pressure was always on also from the overlords as these courts were built at the bottom of a sanctuary. Yeah, hey, no pressure, but uh, your ex is here with Zeus. Break a leg. The go-to game was called pocket talk or hodgepodge, and you had to throw a heavy elastic ball through a hoop. Instead of fist bumping at the end of the day saying good game, good game, good game, the losing side would either one, not survive, dark, or they would have to give over all of their belongings, which also sucks. Yeah, a 20 day game, and then you'd lose all your stuff. That's horrible, what a horrible month. Number three, art. Of course we have to mention art. I'm not saying the Mayans invented art by any means. Each of these ancient civilizations had their own way of expressing the afterlife or life in general. Art was just everywhere. The Mayans specialized in decorating stone landmarks. There's only a handful of woodcut art pieces, but the most popular are these stone pieces from Copan and Carigua. They're extremely complex as well, obviously. Look at these. Rock climbers couldn't even get their fingers in these greaves. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Yet somehow people made them. These zoomorphs here are giant rock sculptures created in the shape of animals, which are always fun. And of course, the Mayans are also famous for their wall paintings dating back to 200 BC. One of the most well-preserved is at Bonampak. 
Look at this, this is incredible. We often look at Egyptians and their art, but this is incredible too, often overlooked. Number two, laws. The Maya made their own ball games, they made their own rules, they made chocolate their own way, but they also created law and order. In a time where food and shelter was sparse, you would think it would be a lot like the Dark Ages, just a bloody mess, you know, full of thieves and bodies and bad stuff everywhere. Well, when you're the first civilization to create the death penalty, everybody is pretty well behaved afterwards. More than fair, yeah, fair. Taking the life of another's was uncommon because of these harsh laws. I mean, you remember how those ball games would end, right? Yeah, imagine crimes. If you were to take the life of another, say you lost a ball game, all your goods are now gone, you react in a horrible way, well, who comes knocking at your door asking questions? Who says you're now a suspect? Sherlock Holmes? No. Say you live with somebody and they commit a crime. Well, not only are they now gone after they get caught, but the victim also gets your land. They get all your goods, cattle, your home, everything. So whoever lives with you as well, well, you better pack your rubber balls. You're out of here. You don't live here anymore, thanks to Good Game Gordo over here. I'm glad certain things stuck around, like the law and order part, but uh, imagine being evicted because your roommate stole some beans. God damn it, Craig. Don't do that. And finally, number one, the underworld. Also referred to as the place of fright. Okay, save the best for last, we love it. Zibalba comes from Mayan mythology. Overseen, of course, by the Mayan death gods, Zibalba came to be in the 16th century Verapaz. The entrance to such a wonderful place was in the cave of Guatemala. So, splunkers beware if you were putting that on your agenda. Maybe avoid this one. Caves in Belize are actually known as the entrance to Zibalba, these water-filled caves again, and they span as far as 300 feet. That's a massive evil front door you want to avoid right there. But you can't just grab a snorkel and frog kick your way to the underworld, it's not that easy. According to ancient Maya scripture, the Popol Vuh, this path once filled with dark obstacles, and when I say dark obstacles, I mean dark. I'm talking a river filled with scorpions and blood combined with houses littered with bats and pure darkness. It's not easy to get through. It's like those haunted houses in Niagara Falls. It's really scary. This is why you don't cheat in Mayan ball games. You end up here. Do you want to be here? No. In fact, if you cheat in Monopoly, I believe you also end up here. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Stacy. Don't cheat. Starting our list off at number 10, the first skull. Before we get into some mysterious happenings in history, we have to talk about the very first Neanderthal skull that was ever discovered. The discovery came about back in 1829. The skull was found in a cave near Angus, Belgium. Now at the time, they didn't even realize it was the skull of a Neanderthal. That knowledge came much later, around 1856. And at that time, quarry workers were ripping apart limestone in a Fedhover cave near the Germany city Dusseldorf. But this skull was found in Neanderthal, a small valley of the Dussel River. Yeah. Hence, you know, the name, now we understand that. The skull was human, but it wasn't. This was game changing. Number nine, medicine. You can only imagine the various injuries Neanderthals would have, hunting down a mammoth or, you know, a bison three times the size of you. Odds are you're gonna get a bruise or two. So what did Neanderthals do at this point? Well, that's what this pile of bones is for. Yeah, it's so dark, right? How did Neanderthals live so long without a pharmacy? All that yelling, no halls, that's gonna hurt. Neanderthals' medical skills are pretty similar to what our ancestors did. Herbal remedies, baby, that's it, herbal remedies. They managed fevers, but when the pain got too bad, chewing on a specific tree may have helped tolerate the pain. So now we're looking back to these piles of bones, we find fragments of these leaves in their, you know, dental cavities. We could study their teeth and be like, mm, yes, I can see what you had for lunch. This makes sense. 40,000 years before penicillin, Neanderthals were chewing on aspirin. They were brilliant. Little dirty secret there. Number eight, ancient art. Okay, here's where we're at with Neanderthals and art. First of all, we don't have actual representational art, but we do have symbolism. That's pretty close and also just as fascinating in my opinion especially when they look like this. These are eagle talons, right? They're about 130,000 years old. They were found recently in the Krapina Neanderthal site in Croatia. Now researchers believe that they were part of a jewelry set like earrings or part of a necklace. I couldn't even make this now with the YouTube tutorial. You know what I mean? Yet somehow civilizations were crafting this thousands of years ago, 130,000 years ago, that's crazy. Number seven. The Indus River Valley Civilization. What's now modern Pakistan was one of the world's earliest societies ever. It was also referred to as the Harappan Civilization or the Indus. And they were actually quite large. We often hear about Vikings and how, you know, there were thousands of them or the 300 Spartan warriors. Well, the Indus were in the millions. Aside from the other earliest civilizations, Egyptians and Mesopotamians, they were considered the most extensive. 
The world's first ever dentists came from the Indus Valley. Something way more interesting than dentist facts is that when compared to Egyptian ancient cultures, the Indus never built any palaces or temples, right? Meaning there were probably no priests or kings. But we still get to study ancient texts. Those are always fun and often confusing. The Indus Valley civilization had a language that we're slowly but surely deciphering. But even so, there's around 200 to 50 to 500 characters that still remain a mystery. So, you know, we can figure out what these guys ate thousands of years ago, but we have no idea what they were saying. Signs be hard. Number six, Gobekli Tepe. Just six miles from the ancient Turkey city Urfa, Gobekli Tepe is 100,000 years old. And there are these massive stone circles created by a civilization that predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. We're convinced it's the world's oldest temple, a holy temple rather. This area in the world, I mean now it may not be a spectacle, but thousands of years ago, you would be able to see the horizon in every direction from this point. You'd also see herds of beautiful animals racing by. There'd be fields of barley, wild wheat, and would have looked like a temple from the Legend of Zelda. It was gorgeous and the landscape was fresh. Mind you, because it was so long ago. It was discovered back in 1960s. University anthropologists, they were doing a survey of the region. They found this place and assumed that it was an ancient cemetery and nothing more, and then it continued on their merry way. Then cut to 1994, Klaus Schmidt was doing surveys for himself, found the same site, and knew right away from the first glance that this was man-made. Oh, imagine that, imagine missing Gobekli Tepe the first time and being like, eh, the cemetery. Number five, Egypt. An ancient civilization in Northeast Africa situated on the Nile Valley, somewhere around 3100 BCE, splitting Upper and Lower Egypt. First occurring as a series of stable kingdoms, separated by intermediate periods such as the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, Egypt was invaded by a number of foreign powers, including the Libyans, the Nubians, Assyrians, Persians, Macedonians, and of course, the Greeks. Predictable flooding meant a timed surplus of crops, which supported larger populations year after year. The many achievements of these people include immense quarrying, surveying, and construction, using a system of mathematics and science to build and organize what we still visit today. Medicine, irrigation, boat making, the Egyptians did it all. They pushed the boundaries with glass technology and even invented new forms of literature and even coined the earliest known drummed up peace treaty. Yeah, don't even get me started on the Sphinx. Have you seen this thing? It's practically being held together with glue and tape at this point. Number four, Mesopotamia, the land of two rivers. Around 10,000 BCE in what is now modern day Iraq, some of the first fully developed Neolithic cultures began to settle in this fertile crescent known biblically and famously as Mesopotamia. Around 8,000 BCE, people in northern Mesopotamia began to cultivate barley and wheat, in which made beer, gruel, soup, and eventually even bread. This is where the earliest signs of civilization began. They were the first to develop trades such as weaving, leatherwork, metalwork, masonry. One of the greatest achievements of ancient Mesopotamia was the invention of the wheel, sometime around 3500 BCE. Mathematics and science was based on a numerical system of 60. This is the source of the 60 minute hour, the 24 hour day, and the 360 degree circle. The Sumerian calendar was three seven day weeks of a lunar month. They were so smart, the astronomers could predict eclipses and solstices. Beer, a calendar, and some wheels? Life was simple back then, huh? Like just not a care in the world. Number three, the Maya. The Mesoamerican civilization of the Maya was roughly between 1800 BC and 900 AD. Located within the archaeological site and the city of San Juan Teotihuacan municipality in the state of Mexico. This site has been classified a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1987. Teotihuacan was the largest city in the Americas with a population between 125,000 and at its peak, millions, making it at least the sixth largest city in the world during its reign. The Maya script is the most sophisticated, highly developed writing systems in the pre-Columbian Americas. Hieroglyphic writing was being used by the third century. They're known for their art, math, calendars, and astronomical systems. Architecturally, the city consisted of palaces, ceremonial ball courts for sport and sacrifice, and of course, structures precisely aligned for astronomical observation. Number two, Rome. In modern history, ancient Rome refers to the Roman civilization from the founding of the city in the 8th century BC to the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. It encompasses the Roman Kingdom, Roman Republic, and Roman Empire. 
It began as an Italic settlement. The settlement grew into the city of Rome, eventually controlling its neighbours through a combination of treaties and military strength. It eventually dominated and acquired much of Europe, and of that, the surrounding Mediterranean Sea. One of the largest empires in the ancient world. At one point, roughly a quarter of the world's population. Contributed to modern language, religion, society, technology, government, warfare, art. Do as the Romans do, right? Its military created a system of government which was the inspiration for modern republics such as the United States and France. They achieved impressive feats such as the empire-wide construction of bridges, ports and roads, as well as the monuments and megalithic buildings splattered all around the world. Every time I flush a toilet, I'm like, man, huh, these guys were good. Number one, Turkey. Located in the foothills of the Taurus Mountains, we arrive at Gobekli Tepe. This Neolithic site lays in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey and is dated around 9500 BCE. The site consists of a number of large circular structures supported by massive stone pillars. Long story short, it's the first construction site of anything. Ever. The pillars are richly decorated with abstract, anthropomorphic carvings of people, clothing, and wild animals, thus providing archaeologists insight into this prehistoric peoples and what they were about. Considered the oldest permanent human settlements anywhere in the world, historians link this revolution to the invention and precursor of agriculture. Gobekli Tepe is a monumental complex built on the top of a rocky mountain far from any known sources of water, and having produced no evidence of agricultural has sparked numerous debates over the years. The site's original excavator, Klaus Schmidt, described it as the Earth's first temple ever, a sanctuary used by groups of nomadic hunter-gatherers from all over the world with no permanent inhabitants. Classified a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2018, radiocarbon dating shows that the earliest exposed structures at Gobekli Tepe were built around 11,500 years ago. It's regarded by some as the archaeological discovery of many lifetimes, since it could profoundly change the understanding of the development of human society and when it exactly started. At number 10, Treaties of the Vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I for one would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the Treaties of the Vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is and the Treaties of the Vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number 9. Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead can contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lots of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At number 8, Liber Lintius. This next ancient text almost 
almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lentius is an ancient text written in Etruscan, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etruscan language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number 7, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas and after being translated might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament, in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as the other researchers have said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number 6, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art, turn out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. Number 5. Hattusa. Rejoice my late 90s PC gamers for I bring another point in your honor, the city of Hattusa of the Hittite Empire. Before this list, my only knowledge of the Hittites came from Age of Empires. I swear man, every time I start up a random scenario and just looking for a little 1998 nostalgia, the Hittites come up and attack me before I can get my walls up. It's the worst. Well, this makes a lot of sense actually because the Hittite Empire was one of the first civilizations to reach the Iron Age. In real life, Hattusa was the capital of said empire. Today, the very beautiful ancient ruins can be found near Turkey. So the question is, how did such a strong empire fall? The answer was the Assyrians. Over time, the Assyrians conquered more and more until Hattusa kind of just was depopulated. There's been some interesting finds at the sites as well, such as two sphinxes that the international community got into an argument over whose museum they should sit in. What's the lesson in this one? Well, nothing lasts forever, and maybe wait till they build my walls to attack me. Just wait, dude. Just wait. Number four, Volubilis. Whoa, what's this? Another World Heritage Site? During the first century of both BC and AD, the city of Volubilis in modern day Morocco was a cultural mixing pot, first settled by the Berbers and eventually became the chief inland city of the Roman Empire province that was located here, which I will totally mess up the pronunciation of, so I'm not going to say it at all. People of both the Islamic and Christian religions would come here trading, living, and creating beautiful mosaics for over 10 centuries, and it became the the capital of Idris I, founder of the Idris dynasty. The parts of the city that we have discovered so far include an aqueduct, thermal baths, and a triumphal arc. And they're all in pretty primo condition given all the crazy weather earthquakes and multiple different inhabitants over the year. It honestly seems like a place a lot of people should have heard of. Maybe I'm just the only one who hasn't, I don't know. Number 3, Antioch. Boy, lots of learning today. And judging from the comments, you guys like learning from us, so thanks guys, that means a lot. Thank you so much. Besides a Monty Python skit about a hand grenade, I hadn't heard about Anatoc. I, who would have thought? I know. Sometimes referred to as the cradle of Christianity, it played a major role in Christianity and its longevity. Founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals, the city was in a prime location and benefited from all sorts of trade routes. 
like the Silk Road for example. Surprisingly, the city grew so much it even began to rival Alexandria, with an estimated population of 250,000 at its peak. Whew, that's a lot of people. It was a happening place. Sadly, it pulled to Detroit and went from a very profitable city to, uh, well, not so popular one. As natural disasters like earthquakes and a declining trade made the city a not so happening place. All I know is that you pull the pin and count to three, not two, three, and certainly not five. I do know that. Number two, Darren Kuyu Underground City. Hey, uh, honey, I, uh, found a hidden room behind the basement wall and uh, you're not gonna believe this, but it leads to an 18 story deep 7th or 8th century underground city used by around 20,000 people as a defense against invaders with ventilation shafts, waterways, stables, churches, and storage. So I, uh, I think the value of our house just went up. Yes, back in 1963, a local man in Cappadocia, Turkey, who was renovating his house stumbled upon an entrance to this massive underground labyrinth of chambers, shafts, and corridors that goes over 85 meters deep into the ground. It had huge stone doors and everything from schools to wine rooms for people to use as a defense against invasion and religious persecution. We don't actually know which civilization built this city, but it once connected to many other underground cities that have been discovered in the area with miles long tunnels. It's honestly the coolest thing I've ever heard of, and I may need to plan a trip. Speaking of, have any of these sites maybe made the travel list for any of you guys? Let me know down below. Mm. Number one, Laventa. Mesoamerica, cool place, lots of treasure, and home of Laventa. These ruins are located in the spicy Mexican state of Tabasco. Constructed by the Olmecs, one of the oldest civilizations in the Americas, Laventa was a civic and ceremonial center. As a ceremonial center, there are tombs, mounds, and ceremonial offerings. Strangely enough, there's a pyramid as well, and some statues that have big head mode cheat enabled. They're big heads. It seems Laventa is a strange mishmash of little sites and artifacts, also including mosaics, altars, and some strange rock formations. All these lovely artifacts were not discovered fully until the 1950s, so it makes you wonder what else we've lost the time in that thick jungle. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Olmec Colossal Heads. The Olmec civilization has often been referred to as the mother culture of Mesoamerica, and from somewhere between 1400 to 400 BC, the civilization rose in the Mexican Gulf Coast. Now, over two millennia later, in 1862, a farmer was digging that very same land that they once lived on, and he came across an extremely large stone head. From here, research continued Continued, and this turned out to be one of 17 stone heads that are thought to have been portraits of the rulers at the time. The statues are all somewhere from 5 to 10 feet tall, and they are extremely heavy. Like heavier than a full grown elephant. I guess that's how we're measuring weight now. Some use imperial, some use metric. I use elephants. The reason it is believed that these stone heads were made to model rulers of the time is because they all share similar features, but they are each made with different expressions, slightly different facial features, and different headdresses. While the first discovery of the stone head was close to the source of the basalt stone that was used to make them, most of the heads are like 60 miles away from there. So we have absolutely no idea how these ancient people were able to make these stones, we just know it wasn't an easy task by any means. In our number 9 spot today we have the works of old men. The works of old men are structures that were first observed from the air by a British pilot in 1927 and they are located near the Azraq oasis in Jordan. There are hundreds of these wheel like structures that are each over 80 feet wide, some even as large as 200 feet. These huge structures have been dated back so far that they might just be the oldest man made creations that we have ever found. While this is all amazing, we have absolutely no idea what they are or why they were created. The theories range from things like sun tracking to cemeteries to some sort of spiritual relevance, but we really just aren't sure. While things like this are incredible finds, and it's amazing that some of the first man-made things still exist on our earth, it is so crazy how we have no idea what they are or how to use them, and unfortunately, especially because of the fact that it's been thousands and thousands of years, it's most likely that the mysteries surrounding them are totally lost with the past. In our number 8 spot today, we 
have the Siege of Masada. The Siege of Masada took place in 73 AD after the fall of Jerusalem, and it was one of the final events of the First Jewish Roman War. The event took place on and around a large hilltop in what is now current day Israel, but here's where this ancient mega project comes in. The Romans began to build a massive earth ramp on the western side of the fortress of Masada. They managed to build it all while under the constant fire from those defending the area, and it was still just under 2,000 feet long, and it rose up 200 feet in the air. After building this ramp, they then managed to push a siege tower up the ramp. This ramp does mostly still exist, and basically what they ended up doing was like extending the size of the mountain that Masada was built on. It is absolutely insane that they did all of this just to capture people. All of that for like 960 people. Imagine if we had ancient Romans now. Suddenly all of our cities would be actually accessible. Ramps for everyone. In our number 7 spot today we have Stonehenge. Perhaps the most famous of all of the monuments on this list, this prehistoric monument is located in England and it is a set of stones that are oriented towards the sunrise on the summer solstice. This stone monument is thought to have been created somewhere from 3000 to 2000 BC and it truly is one of the most famous landmarks ever. Stonehenge is thought to have been an ancient burial ground right from early in its creation for somewhere around 500 years. There are many theories surrounding this incredible monument regarding who could have created it as experts just aren't quite sure. Since this was from a time before we had written records, we may just never know. Maybe this one is just destined to stay a mystery. In our number 6 spot today we have the Yonaguni Monument. Just off of the coast of Yonaguni, Japan, there is a diving location that was first discovered in 1986 by a diver. He noticed some strange sort of formation that was located on the seabed that looked as if it could be some sort of structure, so he swam down to go and investigate. When he went down and didn't find any more answers to his questions, he of course had to spill the tea on what he had stumbled upon. When researchers heard about this, they ended up diving down to check out what this formation could be, and thus the Yonaguni Monument was officially considered discovered. This monument, which kind of resembles stairs made for giants, is made of sandstone and limestone, but there's one super mysterious thing about it. Experts cannot agree on the origins of this thing. Some people believe it was a naturally occurring formation, while others swear that it was man-made. The Yonaguni Monument is at least 10,000 years old, so at the end of the day, anyone's guess is as good as mine. Number 5. Sins of Medical History If you're like me, then you believe in karma. What goes around comes around, baby. So when the fine people of Mesopotamia became ill, doctors had but one answer. Well, you see here, Jim, you angered the gods, and that's why you've been sick. I would certainly smarten up before the gods give your whole family dysentery. Yep, that's right. They believe people were responsible for their own illnesses. Didn't pray last week? Well, that's why you have a fever, Marie. Took a little extra grain for your starving family? That's why you have an incurable sickness, Bob. Now, given the times and that this is one of the first times we gave civilization a good try, I guess that makes sense. Personally, I prefer the doctors who went to medical school and, you know, practice actual medicine. But alright, if that's how things are going, we're doing that. Okay, alright. Number 4. Sumerian Suds Finally, something fun to talk about. The civilizations in Mesopotamia were pretty good at farming. It was kind of a big deal. So was wheat. You know what that means, sports fans. Beer. Sweet wheat ale. As a Canadian, there is nothing more I enjoy than sitting down on a couch with my buddies and just sending it with some beers, buddy. Is a hockey game really a hockey game if the Leafs aren't losing? And if I don't have an ice cold beer in my hands? Well, the fine people of Samaria felt the same way. I mean, there was no ice hockey and, and the idea of two Canucks sitting down on the couch with beer wasn't a thing. But the beer was, yeah. The Euphrates River wasn't the only golden liquid flowing back then. I say golden because they probably had to pee in the river. Their exact brewing process is still a mystery, but it may be linked to the goddess of brewing Ninkasi. The beer was used as a commodity as well as something to kick back and relax. Number 3. Witchcraft So you've got yourself currency, farming, jobs, and economy. Your civilization is becoming the cradle of modern human life. You've got everything you need, right? Well, you'd be wrong. How about fear and panic? Yes, that's right. Witchcraft was something that was happening all the way back in Mesopotamia. I mean, witches are scary, right? Well, while there may be hearsay about witches and the voodoo that they do, it's speculated that from surviving cuneiform texts that some of these witchy rituals were meant to help people and cure illnesses. So a doctor tells you that you've sinned and you're sick, so then you need to go to the local witch's hut 
so that they can cure what ails you. Yeah, never mind. That, that makes total sense. That's a great system. That makes so much sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. I'm sorry I'm yelling. Number two, the dry times. It's well known that the civilizations between the Tigris and the Euphrates River flourished, ushering in the beginnings of many ideas of our civilization. However, as the rivers made land fertile for the agricultural revolution, the people who lived there were truly at the mercy of Mother Nature. One good example of this was the Akkadian Empire, who was really doing good thousands of years ago. However, it's speculated now that what ended the Akkadian Empire was a centuries-long drought. While the rivers provided the irrigation required to grow food and to grow cities, they were also unreliable as floods and droughts were just how things went. The randomness of these events was thought to be punishments or blessings of gods. That seemed to be the only logical explanation, right? That makes sense, sure. Number one, the epic epic. The epic of Gilgamesh just may be the first story to ever be story. Besides my bad English, it's a great tale of Herculean proportions, building a massive wall to protect the city of Uruk, and after many adventures, setting out to find the secret of immortality. This is one of the earliest writings ever, like ever, ever, so that makes it immediately cool. Not as good as Twilight, but a close second in my mind. Team Edward. I number 10, less developed. Back in ancient times, there were so many civilizations around the world who were growing and developing their own customs, tools, and other innovative ideas. Each civilization advanced at their own pace, but when it comes to Mesoamerican civilizations like the Mayans, some have wondered why they weren't as advanced as others from different parts of the world. While the Spaniards, who later colonized many Mesoamerican places, were using guns, the Mayans were still using swords and shields. Many Mesoamerican civilizations never even developed iron tools and stayed using things like stone and obsidian. This is a mystery that has boggled the minds of many researchers. The theory as to why they might not have advanced as much as other civilizations is that it had to do with their environment. To develop a civilization to the level that others around the world had, the advancement of agriculture and animal domestication had to be successful, and because the lands in which the Mayans lived were home to very few native animal and plant species, it made it hard for these people to advance and therefore caused some difficulties for them. At number 9, Body Modification The Mayans, much like other Mesoamerican civilizations, were big on body modification. The modification process often started from birth and continued to be a staple in their society for many years. Some of their body modification practices included skull shaping, where they would use wooden planks to alter the shapes of baby skulls, dental modifications, where they would drill holes into their teeth and insert gems like jade and iron pyrite into them, and even tattoos. They also had a lot of piercings in their culture, from earlobe to nose piercings and even tongue piercings as well. Some of the elite members of society would pierce their tongues with a stingray spine and then pull a thorn freckled or obsidian crusted vine through it. One of the most intense body modifications that they practiced was forcing their kids to become cross-eyed. From a young age, parents would hang beads from their kids' hair across their foreheads so that their kids' eyes would focus on it, and over time they would become cross-eyed. This was a sign of beauty because they associated the look with the way a jaguar's eyes looked before they attacked their prey. Now before I carry on talking about these Mayan mysteries, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Naming Their Kids these days, there are so many ways to name your spawn. There are baby name books and websites. Every year, there is a trending list of baby names for parents to choose from, and some even just go with family names for their kids. But back in the days of the ancient Mayan civilization, name your kid was a very simple process because it just depended on what day the kid was born. The Mayans had a name for every day of their calendar year, so depending on which day you were evicted from the womb, that's the name that you were assigned. That means that there would have been a lot of people in their city with the same name. Name. For boys born in the Mayan civilization, they were just given the name of the day they were born, but for girls, they had to have the number 9 in front of their given name as a sign of feminine power, which I find pretty interesting. Imagine if that was how we name people these days. Based on the Mayan naming system, how many people do you know that might have been given the same name as you? At number 7, Sacrifices The ancient Mayan people were another society who practiced human sacrifices as part of their religious practices. Already, the notion of sacrificing a member of your society to appease the gods sounds pretty gruesome, but when you learn about some of the details of their sacrificial practices, 
gets a little scarier and a little mysterious too. In their religion, they would sacrifice people like prisoners, slaves, or even regular everyday people. They would start by painting the sacrificial person blue, and they were sometimes subjected to torture as well, depending on the context of their sacrifice. Then they would be led up to the top of one of their pyramids, and either be showered with a volley of arrows, or have their heart ripped out through their chest while it was still beating. Talk about heartbreak, right? Yeah? No. Okay. To make things even more gruesome, sometimes the assistant priest at the sacrificial ceremony would then skin the sacrifice and the head priest would then wear the skin and perform a ritual dance. Yeah, it's super gory and definitely something that I'm glad that I won't have to experience. At number 6, Mayan Graffiti. Now here's something really mysterious that I find quite interesting. Turns out that the Mayans did graffiti, yeah. So next time you're out and you see graffiti in your own city, you can look at that and know that the Mayans did the same thing. The Mayans were obsessed with writing, and so they would write and draw on anything they could, including their own stone walls. Archaeologists have found many etchings in stone in many ancient Mayan cities. These etchings were made by people carving into plaster using stone tools or obsidian, and the graffiti usually depicted things like people, animals, deities, lion carvings, handprints, and other glyphs. At first, when researchers discovered these carvings, they thought that they were made by children who lived in the communities, but after further research, they realized that these markings had more of a purpose rather than just being random drawings. No one really knows why they did graffiti, only that it was just there, which really kind of just adds to the mystery of the whole thing. Number 5. Clovis we're taking a look at some mammoth hunters for this next point. This civilization is considered the first inhabitants of the New World. Hunters would use what's called Clovis points to get their next meal. They would use chipped flint. Now they had to hunt bison, mammoths, deer, anything that had skin to use for shelter, but also clothing. In fact, this 10,000 year old civilization may have disappeared at the same time as mammoths. After all, with these historical beasts acting as both your gear and your food, the Ice Age ought to do some damage. Number four. Anasazi. Before the first skyscrapers were built in the 1800s, the Anasazi built massive stone buildings as well on the sides of cliffs back in the 12th century. Some of these walls, by the way, housed up to hundreds of residents. They were huge. What's now present day Massa Verde National Park was pretty intense back in those days. Scientists have uncovered some hints as to where these creative cliff builders disappeared to. Well, violence. Yeah, the thing that's still going strong today, thousands of years later, see back in the 12th century United States, long term drought led the Anasazi to violence and perhaps they just wiped each other out. Other series suggest that the Anasazi had to abandon their massive homes around the 1300s and then travel south. Either or. Number 3. Easter Islanders Back between 300 and 1200 AD, Polynesians used canoes, not carnival cruise ships, but canoes, like little canoes, and then somehow traveled all the way to Easter Island over 2,000 miles away from Chile. That feat in itself is impressive when you start to really think about the Easter Island heads on that island, it gets even more impressive. The Easter Island Moai statues, keep in mind there were hundreds of them at one point, reached up to 32 feet high and weighed over 82 tons. It was a sight to see until the 1800s, because that's when the civilization vanished. But what happened? But many of these statues were destroyed during this time as well, so history doesn't really tell us much. The population was decreased drastically and the island higher ups, be it priests or chiefs, were all overthrown. Well, what happened to them may give us some ideas for the future. See, Easter Islanders cut down so many trees that before those seeds could enter the earth again, rats ate them all. These guys ran out of trees, which means they ran out of rope or the ability to make more canoes. So naturally a civil war began, everyone was freaking out, plus starvation. Also, plus 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 the arrival of Europeans in 1722, they immediately wiped out most of the remaining Easter Islanders. Then around the 1800s, waves of smallpox reduced the amount of island natives to just 100. Number 2. Vikings I'm a big Assassin's Creed fan, and when they announced Vikings as their newest installment, I was so excited. I'm a big Norse mythology fan, but what actually happened to Greenland Vikings? There's a huge mystery around them. Well, around 985 AD, Eric the Red arrived with large fleet to colonize the island, and of course was subsequently banished for manslaughter. Yeah. So now we have two colonies on Greenland, a large eastern colony and a smaller western one. Now these Vikings didn't build massive pyramids, but instead they built stone churches that still stand to this day. These Vikings were around for a few hundred years and at one point in time there were 5,000 Vikings or so. That's incredible, that's a lot of Vikings. But later on in 1721 a missionary expedition arrived and there were not 5,000 Vikings, in fact there were zero Vikings. Archaeologists did the digging and apparently the western 
Roman settlement died off around 1400 AD, and just decades later, the Eastern settlement was, well, simply abandoned. And there's also a handful of family fun movies that hint at what happened to them as well. The Ice Age, well, the small one in the 14th century, but still an Ice Age nonetheless. Number one, the Indus River Valley Civilization. What's now modern Pakistan was one of the world's earliest societies. Also referred to as the Harappan Civilization or the Indus, were actually quite large. We were talking about Vikings in the thousands, but the Indus reached about 5 million. Aside from the other earliest civilizations, be it Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, they were considered the most extensive. The world's first ever dentist came from the Indus Valley, so thank you. Something way more interesting though than dentist facts is that when compared to Egyptian ancient cultures, the Indus never built any palaces or temples, meaning there were no priests or kings. But we still get to study ancient texts. Those are always fun and confusing. The Indus had a language that were slowly but surely decoding today. But even so, there's still around 250 to 500 characters that remain a mystery. Number 10, Great Death Pit. If you are a Sumer king, you likely professed yourself a god and or a superhuman demigod. As such, your followers and members of court were required to treat you as such. With a level of devotion, Andrew saves only for his collection of empty drink bottles he keeps at his desk. Can you please clean that up? Hey! What I'm sure Andrew doesn't expect from those empty bottles is that when he bites the dust, they too must do the same to accompany him to the afterlife. Sumerian kings absolutely did. The biggest example of this ritualistic offing would be the Great Pit of Delifing, discovered in 1922, which was the resting place of approximately 1,800 people, all of which served different kings and queens in the Sumerian capital city of Ur. Some of these followers may have been poisoned, others had a less than ceremonious demise as they had prominent holes in what should be rather intact parts of their skulls. Number 9, Hanging Gardens. Here's a quote from Greek philosopher Strabo. The ascent to the highest stories by stairs, and at their side are water engines, by means of which persons appointed expressly for the purpose and are continually employed in raising water from the Euphrates into the garden. Namaste. Yes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon! I said it twice, oh my goodness, must be kinda cool. What a magnificent sight it must have been, a magnificent construction of beauty, even predating the pyramids of Giza by a rough estimate of 5,000 years. We'll get to that later. Trouble is, this one is kind of a gray area. Here's the later. It could be completely made up by Strabo and others like him, or it could have been destroyed as there are some depictions of a garden existing in a grand palace on the River Tigris near modern-day Mosul, but ah, we're just not sure. We're not, we're not exactly sure. So, beautiful gardens, I hope they were there. Number eight, Sumer. The Sumerians were the oldest known civilization in Mesopotamia. They created the first cities, and a large part of their success and the success of the Mesopotamians in general was due to the invention of irrigation. The land around the Tigris and Euphrates was not so great. It was fertile but prone to flooding pretty often. The solution was to divert water from canals into irrigation ditches. The Mesopotamians realized that the water supply from rivers was unreliable, so they dug a maze of ditches from the rivers to their fields. This created a reliable water source for farming. The crops fed the population, and farmers were able to trade the excess produce, such as onions, garlic, apples, figs, grapes, and pomegranates. That's how the Mesopotamians really flourished. Number 7, Hammurabi's Law. Law students and those taking the bar rejoice because I am talking about Hammurabi's code. When folks were flocking into cities for the first time, the crime rate would have been something to take note of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. King Hammurabi made his code of laws, 282 to be exact, to give justice to all. Like in the commercial sector, for example, for those who steal. The principle of an eye for an eye to make the punishment fit the crime. If you were caught stealing, then perhaps the removal of your arm that stole shall be an acceptable response. Now look, I'm not out here defending crooks. Don't steal, it's bad. But these laws, ew, a little too cruel for me. I'd go through all of them, but, well, you need to get back to your bar exam, so good luck out there, folks. I know you can do it. Number six, the Akkadian Empire. You know you're a big deal when it hasn't been done before you. The Akkadian Empire was literally the first ever empire. They were around for about 100 years and first came to be around 4,300 years ago. And they were big on improving roads and irrigation. Only problem is that irrigation doesn't really help you out much when it stops raining for 290 years. 
The large southern part of the empire was pretty dependent on the northern part for most, or more like all, of its crops and food. So when a drought struck and took away the food, a panicking northern population went to seek help from their southern brethren, who, in return for all the years of food, put up walls to keep them out. Boom! An inciting incident for a violent conflict that brings down an empire. It's that simple, kiddos. At number 5, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Counsel, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two humans twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popol Vuh dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 7 BCE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number 2, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun! That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250 page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies, is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language or code or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is? An alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? Right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text 
may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Kicking off the list at number 10, astronomy. You ever want to date somebody, but they're a Libra and you're a Gemini? Oh, ain't that the worst? Look, dating apps even have this now as a feature. You can write down what your symbol is, like, hi, I'm Kyle, I'm a Leo, and I love waking up early. Those are real bios for real people, and we have the Mayans to thank for all of this. The Maya studied the stars. They were the pioneers of our calendar, which I'll explain a little bit later on, but they also created lunar months. They figured that 81 lunar months added up to 2,392 days, meaning that one lunar month is 29.53 days, incredibly close to our modern moon month, which is crazy. They nailed it that long ago. They also studied Jupiter, Mars, and Mercury. They studied where each planet travels to and when. If you're a Libra, like me, smash that thumbs up. I'm a late Libra too. We're just trouble. We're the worst of the worst. Number nine, the Mayan calendar. It's 2022, which means the world thankfully did not end in 2012, but the Mayan calendar predicted that on December 21st, 2012, apparently it would be this massive doomsday. No, no meteors hit. That was all false. That wasn't a real thing. Thanos didn't snap any of us away. Nothing like that happened. But that day did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner, okay. The Mayan calendar is extremely accurate. Their calendar is 10 thousands of a day more exact than the calendar that the world uses today. They're that precise. We have leap years and stuff just to try and correct it. They used 20 day months and had two calendar years. They had a 260 day sacred round and then a 365 day year. Every 52 years, these two calendars would coincide with one another and this was referred to as a bundle. Imagine if we still had this now, that'd be so confusing. The 10, Nine, eight, what are we saying? Seven. Number eight, chocolate. When I visited the UK, the, the first thing I noticed was how much better your chocolate was. So good. I'm not sure what y'all are doing over there. Maybe it's just made with love. Who knows? But I'm a huge chocolate guy and the UK nails it. Yeah, wash it down with some iron brew. Buddy, what a day, what a great day. The Mayans as well, turns out they loved chocolate. The old mechs of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, but the Mayans made it beautiful. They added some spice to it, literally. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water, chili peppers, and honey. They would make a spicy drink. Are you into this idea? Is this making your lips happy right now? Spicy chocolate drinks? My tummy can barely handle a pumpkin spice latte, let alone a Mayan milkshake. No, thank you. Number seven. Math. One of the earliest uses of the number zero, being in mathematics, came from the Mayans. Thanks. Awesome. They were super advanced in their mathematics, I would say, for their time, but no, in general, they were advanced. We're still trying to understand how they achieved what they did without calculators. It's impressive. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. They didn't have much to work with here, yet somehow it was still enough. The Maya numerical system only had three symbols. This was long before Bedmaz was born. They had zero, one, and five. That's it, you could literally count on one hand. There was a shell shape, a dab, and a bar. These numbers went from zero to 19, and then they would count groups of 20. By the time 36 BC rolled around, the Maya were introducing the concept of zero into their numbering system. Thanks guys, I failed math twice because of those zeros. Cheers. Number six, glyphs. Glyphs at number six, six glyphs. One of the most advanced forms of writing when it comes to all these ancient Americans, the Maya were the most ahead of their time. They invented the glyph, which are these symbols that represent a word or a sound. Like anything else in this civilization, it's beautiful to look at, of course. The Maya used around 700 different glyphs. They're detailed, they're beautiful. A good amount we're able to translate today, but there's still a mysterious chunk that we're trying to figure out. The earliest glyphs engravings go back to the third century BC, meaning that the Maya are the pioneers of writing in Mesoamerica. There are only a few civilizations where writing naturally occurred. The Mayans, ancient Chinese, and the ancient Mesopotamians. In our number five spot today, we have Sacsayhuaman. This site is located in Cuzco, Peru, and it is another fascinating and seemingly impossible stone structure that was built by the Incas. This structure was once believed to have been a fortress, but now it is believed that it may have actually been used for things like ceremonies. Why this is another incredible creation is because of the fact that we can't quite figure out how it could have been built. 
The stones in the structure fit together so perfectly that they are able to stay together without anything holding them in place, and they've done so for years. This, coupled with how large some of the stones were, is enough to completely stump experts. Despite how well the stones all fit together, apparently they all have different shapes, which has led researchers to believe that the building design was kind of made up as the structure was being built. Imagine that, just improvising building a structure and it lasts for hundreds of years and goes on to stump humanity for a while. I'm just saying, that's pretty cool. It becomes more and more apparent how talented and brilliant the Incas really were. In our number four spot today, we have the Nazca Lines. If you were to head to the Nazca Desert, just about 200 miles southeast of Lima in southern Peru, you'd find the most famous geoglyphs in the world the Nazca Lines. Researchers believe that these lines might be something like two millennia old, and other than how they are incredible works of art, they are also completely baffling. The geoglyphs are more than 800 long white lines etched into the desert, as well as 300 geometric shapes and 70 different animal figures. The biggest shape stretches about 1,200 feet across, which leads to my point about why these lines are so incredibly fascinating. These images can only be fully seen from high above in the air. So if Thinking back 2,000 years ago, how did humans make these without the vantage points we have now? I'm not exactly sure, but it definitely is nothing shy of amazing. In our number three spot today, we have Gobekli Tepe. This is a pre-pottery Neolithic archaeological site that is located in Turkey. This site has been dated back all the way to somewhere from 9,500 to 8,000 BC, making it the world's oldest known megaliths, which is just incredible. The site is comprised of a bunch of large circular structures that are being supported by massive stone pillars, many of which are decorated with abstract anthropomorphic details and things which has provided rare and valuable insight into the prehistoric religion and the iconography of the times when this was built. One of the most amazing things about this area is that it was first used at the beginning of the Neolithic period, which marks the oldest human settlements anywhere in the world. It has been called the world's first temple and it was used by groups of nomadic hunter-gatherers from a wide area. Without a doubt, this was one of the best archaeology finds of our modern society, and it gives us just a glimpse into what life was like in prehistoric times. In our number two spot today, we have the Lothagam North Pillar Site. One of the most incredible archaeological finds in Kenya led to a well, it wasn't exactly a horrifying discovery, but it certainly was very unexpected. Around 5,000 years ago, a tribe of herders paused by a lake in what is now Kenya in order to bury their dead. This ended up turning into one of the most massive and monumental construction projects Africa had ever seen, which is no easy feat. For 450 years, they dug into the bedrock, piled up slabs of sandstone, and buried their dead for generations with ritual ceremonies, and this led to what researchers now consider the earliest and largest monumental cemetery in Eastern Africa. Here's the one kind of unexpected thing that they found here at this site though. Along with the bodies of those who had passed, researchers also found 405 gerbil teeth at this site. As it turns out, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this, and it's because they were used to make a headpiece for just one of those who had passed away. This site might not be as large and tall as some of the other monuments like the pyramids in Giza, but what makes them the most remarkable is that this site was made by the people for the people. Not for emperors or kings and queens, it was for tribe members of every age and gender buried alongside each other. In our number one spot today, we have Scara Bray. This is an area that is located in Scotland and it was found in an exceptionally surprising way. In 1850, there was a huge storm that hit Scotland and it was so bad that around 200 people passed away from it. The next day, however, once the storm had passed, Residents of the Orkney Isles began to notice part of the cliff had dislodged, but it uncovered a sort of hidden settlement. Tests were able to date the site back from 3200 BC to 2200 BC, and it was shown to have been inhabited for about 600 years. There were round stone homes here, and the roofs were made out of whalebone and peat. The design of this little city suggested that there wasn't a hierarchy, but rather a group of people living peacefully as farmers, herdsmen, and traders. While the site is small, the houses are in quite great shape for the amount of time it's been. This little settlement is Europe's most complete Neolithic 
Celtic village, and while it is older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids, it's been called the Scottish Pompeii because of how well preserved it is. No one is exactly sure why the residents of this village abandoned it, but it is likely that a change in climate is somewhat, if not fully responsible, and a storm might have been the reason those living here had to leave in haste, which is deduced by how all of their belongings were left behind. Number 10. Corral. The sacred city of Corral is an archaeological site considered to be one of the oldest known civilizations in the Americas. The formation of the civilization took place around 3500 BCE and ran to about 1800 BCE. No other site has been found with such a diversity of buildings and architecture and has since been declared a humanity cultural heritage site by UNESCO themselves. Uncovered around 1905, Peruvian archaeologists provided the first documentation on the civilization at Corral. They appear to have an economy of some sort, selling mostly textiles and fish. The civilization is considered a pre-ceramic culture, since archaeologists have yet to find any sculpted or painted art. However, they did find a system of writing called Quipu, which is a string-based recording device suggesting a proto-writing of some sort. They were widely known for their architecture of huge earth landscaped projects of mounds, particularly a massive labyrinth of underground circular connecting plazas. They were ahead of their time. Yeah. Number 9. The Etruscans Side note, if you dig what we do here on Bumblebee, make sure to Hulk smash that like button for us, huh? The Etruscan civilization was a people of Etruria in ancient Italy. They had a common language, culture, and formed a federation of cities. Their territory covered now what is Tuscany, Umbria, and Lazio. The earliest evidence of this culture is from about 900 BC. This is the period of the Iron Age considered to be the earliest phase of Etruscan civilization. With a maximum population peaking around 750 BC, the earliest examples of writing are inscriptions found around 700 BC. They developed a system of writing derived from the Euboean alphabet. The language remains only partly understood, making modern understanding of their society and culture heavily dependent on later Roman and Greek sources. Number 8. Inca the Incan Empire was the largest of pre-Columbian America. The center of the empire was the city of Cusco. The Incans arose from the Peruvian highlands in the late 12th century. The Spanish began their conquest of the empire in 1532 and by 1572, the last Inca state was fully conquered. Before they fell, the Incas were able to construct one of the greatest imperial states in history, accidentally. Without the use of a wheel, knowledge of iron or steel, or even a system of reading and writing. Yeah, these guys were good. About all 14 million of them as well. The empire included construction of monumental architecture, stone and road work reaching to all corners of the empire, and even finely woven textiles. They functioned without money and without markets. Instead, exchange of goods and services was based on individuals, groups, and rulers. Taxes consisted of a labor obligation, usually construction. Everyone was either lifting or carving, you know? The Inca rulers would even grant access to land goods and celebratory feasts for the workers if you did a good job. Dude, this place sounds awesome. Sign me up. Number seven, Indus Harappan. The Indus Valley Civilization, aka the Harappan peoples, was the first urban civilization from roughly 3300 BCE to 1300 BCE. Located in South Asia, modern day Pakistan, and Northwest India, the Harappans built dozens of sprawling cities with immense planning and architecture. I'm talking water supply systems with recycled drainage, large skyscraper sized buildings. They even developed a number of technologies, including one of the world's first systems of weights and measurements. New techniques in metallurgy producing copper, bronze, lead, and tin. These people were smart. In addition to math and engineering, the Indus Valley civilization enjoyed arts and crafts. Even games and toys have been found. Baked brick houses, clusters of large iron non-residential buildings, and handcrafted metallurgy. We start to see the foundations here, people. There are even three cities here that are now all UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The latest in 2021, the Kalishchen Desert. Number six, Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were a Semitic group of speaking people who emerged around 3000 BC. The term Phoenicia is ancient Greek, meaning a colored dye. It's debated whether Phoenicians were distinct from the broader group of speaking peoples known as the Canaanites. The term Canaanites loosely corresponds to the groups referred to as the Phoenicians, so it's a little messy back then on who's exactly who. The Phoenicians rose in the mid 12th century following the decline and collapse of the late Bronze Age. 
They were renowned as traders and mariners, becoming the dominant commercial power around. They developed an expansive maritime trade network, helping the exchange of cultures and ideas between Greece, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. They established colonies and trading posts across the Mediterranean as Phoenician society and culture centered around mostly commerce and seafaring. As a kicker, of course, historians and archaeologists revealed this civilization most likely has the world's oldest verified alphabets. I can't even build a boat now, let alone back then with barely an alphabet? Like how? At number five, Mayan creationism. Whether you believe in evolution or creationism, no one really knows for sure how the world began. There are a number of theories from both sides, but again, it's such a huge notion that it's next to impossible to know where everything began. Every culture has their theory, and the Mayans were no exception, and they even came up with their own story for the creation of life. The Mayans believed that the Earth was created in 3114 BCE, and this date coincides with the beginning of the Mayan calendar. According to their mythology, the world was created in four parts. First came the animals, then wet clay, then wood, and then finally humans, which were said to be made out of maize, which is essentially corn. They believed that all of this was created by artisan gods who crafted the Earth and the heavens like sculptures. It's a pretty cool story, but again, we will never know if their theory was actually true. Hi number 4, Afterlife. For the Mayans, their version of the afterlife was quite intense and complex. They thought of the afterlife as a soul's journey to paradise, but there was also no guarantee that said soul would actually reach eternal peace. First, a person's soul would have to pass through a terrifying underworld that was said to be the home of frightening deities who had names like Bloody Teeth, Flying Scab, and Bloody Claw. Already quite scary, right? Thankfully, not everyone had to endure this terrifying journey to the underworld. Those who were exempt were victims of sacrifice, women who died in childbirth, those killed in warfare, and people who died playing the game Pocketalk, which was their bloodiest sport. So really, you had to earn your death in this culture, otherwise your journey to the afterlife would be brutal. Which makes a lot of sense as to why death and sacrifice were such a huge part of their culture, because no one wanted to die a lame death and have to face bloody teeth and bloody claw in the afterlife. Even though some Mayan souls were believed to have found their way to paradise, they also believed that life was a never ending cycle, going from life to death and back again, so even if you did reach paradise, you might not have stayed there for long before being thrown right back into the circle of life once again. At number 3, Burial Rituals. On the topic of Mayan death beliefs and rituals, we should talk about their mysterious burial rituals as well. For the Mayans, death was a big part of life, and when you were laid to rest, that wasn't the end of your burial ritual. While your soul was passing through either the underworld or paradise, things were still going on with your remains even years after your passing. The Mayans had tombs for their dead, they often wrapped the bodies, placed them in specific positions, and even provided the person with food for the afterlife. But even after their burial, the Mayans would often exhume their loved one's skeletal remains years later and paint them bright red, and this was especially common for key Mayan rulers and officials. But that's not the only way that they practiced ceremonial burials. Sometimes before being buried, they would cremate the person and the remains would be placed in decorative urns. It all just depended on the person and their level of importance in their society. At number two, currency. Before I get into the ancient Mayan currency, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me what your currency is. I think it's so cool to see how many different types of currency there are around the world, so let me know yours. Now let's get into how Mayans paid for things. They used chocolate as their currency back in their heyday. The cacao bean was a big staple in Mayan culture, and they had been cultivating it for years. It became so important to them that they even created a deity devoted to the bean. They started off using the cacao bean as a food source, creating chocolate beverages and food, but soon the cacao bean evolved in their society, going from being something edible with bartering value to being a legitimate currency. There are ancient Mayan artworks that depict the cacao bean being used as money in their society, and it's just fascinating. Do you think that you would have liked to pay for things in chocolate? If that was a thing, I wouldn't have any money. And finally, at number one, downfall. The biggest mystery that surrounds the ancient Mayan civilization is what the heck happened to them. To this day, no one quite knows for sure what happened to them and how their civilization died off. During the 8th and 9th centuries, the centers of the Mayan southern lowlands started to decline and they were abandoned not too long afterwards. This decline was coupled with the decline of architectural advancements and construction. 
There are a few theories to explain what might have happened to the Mayans, like overpopulation, foreign invasion, peasant revolt, or even the collapse of key trade routes. More environmental explanations for the Mayans' decline include environmental disaster, sickness, or even climate change. Some research have even theorized that there was a 200 year drought that might have contributed to the civilization's collapse. Right now though, we have no idea. So by far the most mysterious thing that the Mayans did was disappear. Coming in at number 10, Nineveh. The Nineveh civilization was one of the oldest and most impressive civilizations of the ancient world. Located in what is now modern day Mosul in Iraq, this civilization thrived mostly under the rule of King Sennacherib from 704 BC to 681 BC. Under his leadership, Nineveh was made the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Their kingdom was massive and had a lot of impressive infrastructure like a 15 gate wall around the city as well as parks, aqueducts, canals and an 80 room palace. This place was so extravagant that some scholars today believe that the famous hanging gardens of Babylon were actually located in Nineveh and were commissioned by King Sennacherib. Other than their infrastructure, their culture was also incredibly impressive as well. Nineveh was known as a center for the development of arts, sciences and architecture and scribes and scholars from elsewhere would flock to Nineveh to further their studies. They had a library that contained over 30,000 inscribed clay tablets, and one of those tablets included a story of a great flood that drowned the world except for one man who survived by building a boat and searching for dry land. Does that story sound familiar? It might, since it's an early version of the story of Noah's Ark. This version of the story though was inscribed a thousand years before it ever reached Hebrew text. Now even though this was a large and powerful civilization, all good things must come to an end, and they met their end after a royal feud led to the breakup and this led to the joint forces of Persians, Babylonians and others in the area to burning Nineveh to the ground. Number 9. The Mesopotamian Civilization Next up we have the first civilization ever recorded in history. Their origins date back to as early as 500 BC in what's now Iraq, Syria and Turkey. Mesopotamia is a staple in history. It's actually the first society that developed agriculture and its name translates to between rivers or land between rivers. It was a perfect spot to domesticate animals for farming and for food. The oldest wheel ever was found in southern Mesopotamian city of Ur. They invented the wheel, cursive writing, and something even more important than all, they invented beer. The oldest recipe for beer comes from Mesopotamia. Wheels, poems, beer, this sounds like the world's oldest, and dare I say it, best party. Of course, aliens also come into play too when looking back at Mesopotamian culture. They had an advanced understanding of the cosmos using astronomical instruments. Now, one of these instruments was this Venus tablet of Amos Sadaka, which could predict these astronomical events. Maybe our earliest civilization made contact and now they're just trying to reach out. Can you get ghosted over a tablet? Probably. I number eight, Vinca. We're throwing it all the way back to the Neolithic period because we're talking about the Vinca civilization. Vinca is known as the oldest Neolithic civilization in Europe. These guys were establishing their own civilization in the Stone Age long before civilizations like Egypt and Mesopotamia. Though we don't know all that much about them, we do know that they had one of the earliest writing systems in the world. Researchers have discovered around 700 characters that are believed to have been their way of forming written sentences, though this is all just a theory for now since these characters have yet to be translated. The archaeological evidence that has been found from the Vinca civilization suggests that this group of people thrived in the area along the banks of the Danube River for more than a thousand years before being abandoned. No one really knows why the Vinca civilization abandoned the area or where they went, but maybe one day we will get those answers. Number 7. The Mayans it's 2021, which means the world thankfully didn't end in 2012. But that movie was good. Kind of, not really. But the Mayan calendar did predict that on December 21st, 2012, this would be the end of us. No meteors hit and Thanos didn't snap away any of us, but that date did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner. These guys were crazy. One of the earliest uses of the number zero being in mathematics came from the Mayans. They were super advanced for their time, and they were also quite artistic. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. I can't write four sentences down on paper without my wrist hurting. I have to like slap it around for a minute. These guys are on a whole new level. These stories date all the way back to the late pre-classic period, so around 300 BCE. That is so old. The Olmecs of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, sure, but like the art that we see etched into the stone walls around them, the Mayans made it beautiful. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water and chili peppers and honey. They would make it as a spicy drink. 
I'm gonna stick with the old pumpkin spice for now. I think that's the riskiest I'll go. Thanks so much though. Dab it. At number six, Mehergar. Even though Mehergar was a pretty impressive civilization, no one really knows about it because very little interest was invested in learning more about it. Mehergar was one of the oldest civilizations in the world, situated in what is now modern day Pakistan. Excavations of the site started back in the 1970s, but due to the government's lack of interest, looting, and land erosion, it made it hard to learn much about this ancient settlement. From evidence that has been gathered, we do know that Mehergar had a population of around 25,000 people, and based on some of the remains recovered from this ancient civilization, there was evidence of dental surgery, which as you can imagine, isn't really something you see very often, especially at the time that this civilization existed. Other than that, many of the other secrets of the civilization are buried very deep in the earth, so it makes it much harder for researchers to uncover them. What has been found though are some pretty well preserved buildings made from brick, and even a formal cemetery. Who knows what else we might learn from this site. Number 5. The Gentleman's Tablet Hey, at the end of the day, we're only human, and sometimes we do as they do on the Discovery Channel. We wouldn't be here if the people of ancient times did not put on a little Marvin Gaye and just feel the groove, baby. Well, strangely enough, not much has changed since then. And that includes our own curiosity with each other's gabagool. My generation has OnlyFans, the last generation had Playboy and Penthouse, and maybe the Martha Stewart magazine. That woman can do no wrong. Well, folks, in ancient Mesopotamia, they needed their fix too. Playboy was a few thousand years away, so the next best thing was these clay tablets depicting actions that my editors are wondering how they're even going to show you. This ain't junior high health class. Y'all know how this works. So did the ancients. It's why there's a few of these tablets floating around and uh, in different positions, taking bricked up to a whole new level. Number four, a pillar of flesh. Another empire that rose to prominence in Mesopotamia would be the Assyrian Empire. And the kings here were pretty damn awful. They ruled with bloody iron fists of torture and mass life ending escapades. One such king, Ashurnasirpal II, inherited a huge strong army from his father. And using it, he would destroy pretty much anyone who didn't like him in ways that may have left his soldiers with PTSD. Like actually. He burned, blinded, and removed the craniums of rebels, set maidens on fire, and condemned opposing soldiers to die of dehydration in the desert. But I think what may be the worst way he dealt with those who opposed him would be when he flayed all the chiefs who had revolted and built a pillar that he covered with their skin. Hey, I think I think I feel my lunch coming back up. Andrew, Andrew, get in here. No. Number three, Sumerian suds. If you're like me, then you love a good beer. Frankly, I could drink them ice cold or warm, just like our friends across the pond. Cheers. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. With that being said, I could never enjoy my Canadian lifestyle if it weren't for the Sumerians, as they may have invented the first beer. No more drunk hockey fights, no more cotty weekends in the Muskokas, and no more just sending her buddy. You got a sender. Being the agricultural revolutionaries that they were, it makes sense that they would discover the fermentation process of wheat. Tablets found in excavations depict people drinking out of large jars that are speculated to be filled with a gorgeous 3.5% brew, which if you ask me, is the best way to enjoy said beverage, with friends around you in a big jar. Number 2. Gilgamesh Even if you don't know who it is, it's likely you have heard the name Gilgamesh. In Mesopotamia, Gilgamesh was the hero of Uruk. Just like how Big Ched is the hero of my dreams. <laughs> and in said city, stone tablets and even the art on walls tell his stories and legends. That's Gilgamesh, not Andrew. According to the stories, his mother was thought to be the goddess Ninsun, and his father was, give me a sec here, Lugalbanda, the god king of Uruk. And apparently, this half man, half god was the ruler of the city for 126 years, which would be completely insane if it were actually true. It could be, we don't actually know. The second half of the epic poem of Gilgamesh is all about him trying to figure out the meaning of life. And buddy, I mean, same here. We're all just dust in the wind, dude. Dust in the wind. Number one, the wheel, the cradle of civilization. There's a lot that happens in Mesopotamia, and Adam and I would need a whole history class to tell you everything that was happening in the Middle East. Maybe one day we'll actually teach a we class. Who knows? Yeah, maybe that'd be a good idea. But one thing I can tell you is that thanks to ancient Sumerians, we have wheels. Maybe it was a pottery wheel. Maybe it was for a carriage. Maybe it was because we just like to make stuff. I don't know. But I don't think I need to tell you how important wheels are and how they literally reinvented the wheel. 
It was extremely revolutionary. Boats, floats, doors, stores, drawers, planes, trains, cars, Mars if you count the rover, bikes, flower bales, gears, cogs, clocks, and your 11th grade best friend Buddy. He was wheeling and dealing.